Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my girlfriend of seven years told me that either we have kids now or she's breaking up with me. My girlfriend and I, we have a rocky relationship. When it's good, which is 98% of the time, it's great. We have so much fun together, we laugh a lot, and we even started a business together. But when it's bad, it's really bad. We typically have problems one weekend every month. When my girlfriend goes out and drinks, she gets really mean. It's not uncommon for us to get into an argument and for her to walk out of the restaurant or bar and just leave me there. When this happens, she'll ignore my texts, calls, and I won't see her until she decides to come home, sometimes which is very late at night, 4 a.m. She also calls me names. We always make up the next morning and I keep most of it to myself. If I bring it up, she usually says that I'm the problem and I'm controlling and I drive her to do these things. She's given me an ultimatum to have kids or break up. It's been seven years of dating and six years of living together. I've told her that we shouldn't have kids when our relationship is so volatile. She gave me until tomorrow to make a decision. But how can I have kids and get married when one weekend a month she's so mean to me? We don't have any trust because she'll walk out on me in an argument, go to a bar, talk to other men, etc. She won't fully acknowledge her actions. I've told her over and over that I need at least six months of proving to me that we can have a good relationship without feeling hurt. There's so much resentment that when I bring up the thing she says, she places blame on me. About two months ago, she had a terrible health scare and had to go into emergency surgery. I spent seven days and nights with her in the hospital. I didn't leave her side once. I thought the experience was going to solve our problems, but it hasn't. Also, out of the blue, two weeks ago, she said she's going to sign a lease for an apartment because she doesn't think I'm ready for kids. I asked her not to move out and to give me two weeks. The two weeks are up. I understand she doesn't want to waste any more time and I don't want to waste her time either. But I'm conflicted and confused. I'm scheduling a call with a relationship therapist for later today, but I haven't told friends or family about this. I'm leaning towards saying something to the effect of, I love you and I don't want this to end, but I can't start having kids and get married when we have these problems. I think the problems should be fixed first. If you can't wait for that, I guess we have to break up. Well, it's probably time to break up then. You've been together for seven years. If you're not going to have kids now, when's it going to happen? It's just going to keep being postponed. And you're right. Why should you have kids with her when your relationship is so dysfunctional? It's been multiple years of a roller coaster. If things haven't stabilized by now, it's not going to happen. Kids won't save your relationship. It thickens the plot and makes things more complicated. You need to deal with this toxic behavior on her end. It's probably best to break up and get it over with. Seems like everyone wins with the breakup. Break up with her. Listen bro, it's pretty clear from your post that you don't want to marry her and don't want to have kids with her. Maybe you told her the issues you had, maybe you didn't. But regardless, you're here now. She gave you an ultimatum that you're not interested in accepting, so the best you can do is try to stall, which is what you've been doing with the counseling thing. Nah. Your relationship has hit its expiration date. The only thing left to do is the logistics of untangling your lives and separating. Well, what do you think? Should OP do relationship counseling or just break up with her? Please let us know. Bruh, I really hope he lets her become someone else's headache. Am I the jerk because I don't want to take care of my husband's ex-wife? I, 32 female, have been married to my husband, who's 40, for two years. He brought two kids into the marriage and I have one of my own. We don't have any kids together. My husband was previously married and has been divorced for about a decade. His kids live with their mother nearby, like 20 minutes away. Initially, she showed some petty behavior, but nothing major. She's very entitled and judgmental. She often makes snide remarks about my working too much, etc. She would make contrasting statements about me and my husband's marriage compared to hers. To the point where one day, I told her that her relationship with my husband was over and she needs to move on. My husband backed me up and she stopped her ways. I honestly don't think she's over him, but that has nothing to do with me. She's unemployed since getting fired 15 years ago and relies on her kids to get more time and money from my husband. She's been unwell lately, not managing her health effectively, and has been using her condition to collect sympathy points from my husband. Asking him to be there at doctor's appointments, of course to watch the kids while she's there. Asking him for rides constantly because she doesn't feel safe driving. She always wants to tag along when we take the kids out. She has a boyfriend, by the way. Lately, she's been suggesting to my husband that she isn't well enough to take care of her kids. 
Right now, they have shared custody, and they're with us every other weekend and during school vacations. She told my husband that I should sell my house, which I bought before we even met, to downgrade and buy a smaller home and build her a tiny house on the land close to us to provide more support for the kids and her. I was flabbergasted that she would even mention this to me. I couldn't understand why I needed to sell my house to accommodate her. I offered to have the kids live with us, but she declined, stating that she prefers to stay close to the kids and doesn't trust us to raise them. She has a boyfriend and family nearby, but insists on receiving care only from us, even saying that my husband made vows to her before he made vows to me. I feel totally disrespected. I don't want to sell my house and I don't want to have a grown woman freeloading off of me. I believe she should rely on her existing support system. Most of my in-laws say that I'm being selfish and I don't need such a big house anyway. My husband hasn't expressed anything either way, which is annoying. I want to stand my ground, but I'm starting to feel like a jerk because she is sick. Update. Thanks everyone. I think I need to stand my ground here. I'll speak with him tonight and update. I'm really tired of his ex and I don't think she should be the main character in our lives anymore. I want to put this here because a lot of people have been asking why my husband won't speak up. This was my response. He says he doesn't want to be a deadbeat father because his father was and she often threatens to not allow him to see them. Even at our wedding, she would not allow the kids to be there unless she was also invited. Update. I spoke to my husband and told him that there was absolutely no way I was going to sell my house. I told him that my house was an investment that I planned to one day pass it to my kids as an asset. That he and his parents and his ex are dead wrong for suggesting that I sell it. I said that if his parents have something to say, then they can build a tiny home for her on their 10 acres of land. He agreed and said he's been feeling bad that he was entertaining the idea, but his ex was guilting him because of her condition. She has MS. I told him that he will no longer be supplementing her lifestyle and no more running errands. I'm his wife and I should be his priority. I told him that he has to call her in front of me and tell her this. He called her and told her that he will no longer be used as a placeholder for her boyfriend and she needs to stop trying to manipulate everyone. She said it was unfortunate that I was acting insecure and that I was interfering with their healthy co-parenting relationship. She said that I was young and immature and should consider their kids and she knew that this would happen one day. I told her that she needs to stop being lazy and take care of herself and her kids and stop freeloading off everyone else. I told her that she needs to be focusing her attention on her current relationship because that's her best shot at a decent future because we are pulling back effectively immediately. She immediately started crying and said she was feeling sick and needs to go to the emergency room and needed to end the conversation to protect herself and her health. We couldn't really get into outlining all of the boundaries before she just hung up and blocked both of us. I typed out an email and copied all parties involved and sent it to her. I'm so mad right now. I'm seeing red. I want to provide clarity. She was recently diagnosed maybe a year ago. She's been manipulating since I met her, but she has been more invasive after her diagnosis. She has been out of work for 15 years, which is the only reason that I call her lazy. She's on every government subsidy we could get her on. I helped facilitate this when she was diagnosed, but she keeps wanting and expecting more. I admit that I felt bad for her for a long time, which is why I let it go on for so long, but asking me to sell my house is beyond my limit. This is extremely weird. Your husband needs to be 100% on your side. He needs to shut this down now, not you, him. Otherwise, he's in on it and you really need to look at this as you versus everyone else problem. Not the jerk for not wanting to help your husband's ex. Any family members who call you selfish can step up and take care of her themselves. Am I the jerk for telling my husband to deal with it when suffering from a kidney stone, like he told me while I was in labor pain? So I, 26 female, and my husband, 32 male, welcomed our baby boy about a year ago. It was my first pregnancy and honestly, it was pretty rough. The labor pain was incredibly severe. Still, I wanted natural delivery, so I went through all of it. Due to the severe pain, I couldn't control and I was screaming and crying. My husband, who hasn't slept the whole night, got agitated by the screaming and said to me to just try to deal with it instead of screaming like this. I honestly cried because of his comment and the pain. The baby was born a few hours later and we sort of forgot the incident. A few days ago, my husband felt sudden pain in his stomach and it only got more and more severe, to the point where we had to take him to the hospital at that moment. The doctor did a few checkups and told him that he had a kidney stone and needs treatment. Since the pain was so severe, my husband got painkiller shots. 
Even during that, he was screaming at the top of his lungs. At that moment, I got petty, and since I was already fussy from sleeplessness due to taking care of a toddler, I said to my husband, can't you just deal with it for a while? Why are you shouting so much? He was shocked and then later remained quiet. When we went home, he was still quiet, and when asked, he told me how insensitive I was and how he felt so bad. To this, I reminded him of the time when he said the same thing. Now he's so angry and calling me petty that he didn't mean anything, but I had malicious reasons. So, am I the jerk? Edit. To all the people asking if we love each other, yes, we do. It wasn't like I held on to what he said to me. However, in that moment, everything was so similar to that time that I remembered that incident, and in the spur of the moment, I said it to him. I did not ask him to go out of the delivery room or make a big deal about it that time because even though I was hurt, I understood his sentiments as well. Stress from work, sleeplessness, overwhelming feeling of being a parent for the first time, and a constantly screaming wife can really mess with a person. I didn't want to keep him away from being the witness of his kid's birth or ruin his later moments with the baby just because of that. Was it a childish thing to say? Yes. But that does not mean we didn't fulfill our responsibilities. He took care of me and did everything a dad should, and I did everything for him likewise. No, we are not going to divorce each other for such silly banters. It's not like we always fight or act petty. If I wanted to be real petty, then I could have done a lot of other things as well, but that wasn't my intention. Yes, we have childish conversations sometimes, but they are usually funny banters. It's one of the very few times where I wanted to come and get some insight. Update. I went to my husband and apologized. He said I don't have to and he was not angry, just embarrassed. We talked about it and actually found it quite funny. Sure, he was acting like he was angry, but that just means that he rolled his eyes at me and had an expression like, are you serious? So yeah, he doesn't hate me and neither do I hate him. I will be preparing a nice dinner for us all since the past few days have been so exhausting and my husband needs a good treat as well. So yeah, nothing too crazy as some of you expected. Have a good day, people. Edit 2. It wasn't really about which pain is worse. Everyone has their own experiences. To everyone who shared their experiences, I hope you are all in better health now. I could see my wife doing exactly this sort of thing if she were in that situation, so I'll go with not the jerk. Was it a mature or a kind decision? Not really, so I suppose it makes you a little mean. But hopefully he will quit wallowing in self-pity and realize that dismissing the pain of someone he claims he loves is beyond callous and was wrong of him. You were petty, but you were justified. Tell him your pettiness stems from how you have never forgotten how he spoke to you when you were at your most vulnerable. How'd he like them apples? Not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Hey Reddit boy, didn't you just have a kidney stone a few months ago? I sure did. So I'd record for 10 minutes, then go lay down and roll around in agonizing pain for 10 minutes and repeated that cycle for half the day. Wow, now that's dedication. Am I the jerk for controlling what my boyfriend eats? I, 23 female, have been dating my boyfriend, Jake, who's 24, for four years. I'd say we're a very happy couple overall, but lately this argument has come up that's divided us. He's always had unique tastes. Cereal with orange juice instead of milk, mayo and butter sandwiches, and raw onions have been the worst culprits. I'll put up with these. We all have our quirks, right? Well, two weeks ago, he started eating garlic as his midnight snack, Raw cloves of garlic. I can't share a drink with him without it reeking of garlic somehow. And kissing him? It's like shoving a clove of garlic straight into your mouth. He swears that he's only eating them because he didn't want them to go to waste and that he would stop once he finished the head of garlic. But just when I finally thought it was over, I caught him sneaking a second one into the kitchen last night when he thought I was asleep. I confronted him about his secret grocery trip this morning and he got really defensive and denied it. I'm trying not to be a nag here, but it's really wearing on me. The garlicky aura surrounding him makes me want to avoid him at all costs. But like, I don't want to do that because he's my boyfriend. Am I the jerk for giving him an ultimatum of no more eating garlic? Edit. His diet seems healthy overall and he goes to the gym a lot. He had a doctor's appointment not long ago and I don't think anything came up, but I can ask him to go again. If you really can't stand it, convey that. OP. I tried to explain when I talked to him this morning. I told him that the other weird food combos don't really bother me as much, but the particular smell of this one is too much. He said that I just need more time to get used to it, but it's been nearly two weeks already. Maybe if you eat more, you'll get used to it. And maybe he's suffering from a vitamin deficiency and should go to a doctor. OP, I tried that too. 
When he first started, I ate a bite just to see if it was actually good, but I just can't bring myself to eat anymore. He's not talking to me this morning, but I'll try texting him tomorrow about a doctor's appointment. As for his usual diet, besides the occasional unique food choice, I think he's pretty healthy. Is there anything else weird going on? We haven't been going out on our usual dates for the past two months because he's had to leave to take calls a bit, but that's just because he's been swamped at work. Nothing weird. His busy season is almost over though, which is good. Update. Yesterday evening, I tried texting him about seeing a doctor like you guys suggested. He never replied. I guess he still has me muted. I spent the night tossing and turning. I kept going over what I was going to say to him when he got home. Not that it mattered because he didn't come back home last night. That worried me, so this morning I checked his location. He stopped sharing it with me through his phone, but I guess he forgot I can still see it on Snapchat. It showed him about 30 minutes away at some house off of a random back road. I was pretty confused and honestly panicked. All of his friends that I know live in the city. I tried to call him again but was sent a voicemail, so I drove over there to see what was up. When I got to the house, I noticed a woman about my age gardening in the front yard. I was pretty upset already, so I flat out asked her if she had seen my partner. She seemed surprised and asked if I meant Jake. She invited me inside and there he was. Apparently, she's into gardening and they met at her stand last fall when he went to stock up on onions at our local farmer's market. They hit it off and have been seeing each other for the past six months and made it official back when his busy season started. She said lately she's been giving Jake the garlic she grew last summer since it's going to go bad soon. That's why he was so insistent on eating it by himself instead of cooking it into a shared dish like normal, and why he's been eating onions like an apple instead of letting me use them on my sandwiches. He didn't want to give me her presents because in his own words, she grew it with love for me, and if you ate them, you would have known. <laughs> At that point, I saw red, so I just left. Since then, Jake's been blowing up my phone about how we can fix this and that he won't do it again, but I'm so over it at this point. Just when I thought my life couldn't get any worse, while I was moving his stuff to the curb, I found his stash of garlic. Shoved in the back of his closet was one pound of garlic in a Home Depot bucket along with letters she had written him. I'm keeping the garlic. I don't think we can ever come back from his cheating, but I'm going to at least get some good meals out of this terrible situation. Please send me your favorite recipes to use the garlic in. I need a distraction to keep my mind off of everything. I really don't want to be laughing at OP's misfortune, but finding love letters that your boyfriend's garlic farmer affair partner has written next to a pound of garlic in a Home Depot bucket is a hilarious mental image. My boyfriend's family lost their home in a fire and they're asking me to put my name on a mortgage so that they can buy a new house. I've been dating my boyfriend for almost four years now, living together for about two. I'll cut to the chase. His family, his mom, dad, and sister, they had a house fire in January and they've stayed with us in our one-bedroom apartment for a couple of weeks until their insurance got them a hotel. Now they're in the hotel. His family had 10 cats and 9 of those cats are in the apartment with us currently. So it's me, him, and 9 cats right now. They pay for the food and the litter, but I've bought them a cat tower and some toys. They've basically destroyed my couch, but I figured they would and it was a cheap couch. This past Sunday, two days ago, they went to see a realtor to talk to him about buying a house. Where they lived was a place they rented for a decade and the landlord was upset about the fire so they don't want to go back there even when the house is fixed. My boyfriend was supposed to be the one on the loan because his parents aren't citizens and would have to pay a huge down payment. But since he has a social security number, he can get a regular rate. The problem is he doesn't make enough on his own. If I helped with the loan, our combined income would be enough to qualify. If I go in on the loan, we could stay with his family in the house and save for our own house later. We'd have more space, which would be great, because I'm trying to start a business and I wouldn't be living in the one bedroom with nine cats. But it's also a 30-year mortgage loan. He's told me that whatever I decide to do won't affect our relationship, but I'm afraid this will for me. If I don't decide to go in on the loan, his parents said they'll get a trailer and take the cats, but his sister, who's 19, would still probably end up living with us because her job is close to us and she doesn't drive. I feel like I'm losing it. I feel like no matter what I do, I'm losing something. I'm so conflicted. I've asked the advice of my mom and some friends and they think they're asking too much. But if I don't go in on the house, I'm still in this apartment that costs too much and adding an extra person to our space. So I'm asking, should I just let them put my name on the mortgage loan or should I accept that his sister will be living with us? I hate to add any more elements of stress to their lives because they've already been through so much, but now it's leaking into my life a lot.
Edit. I like to clear this up. They're not pressuring me, but it's obviously a tense situation for them because they know it's their housing in the line. They're just kind of at the mercy of insurance paying for their hotel. It's a desperate situation and a desperate ask. I will talk to my boyfriend today about different options. I spoke to my mom, who is a homeowner, and she advised against this. But seeing all of your reasons as well, like not being able to get a second mortgage because of this one, is a nail in the coffin. I'll suggest his sister stay with us as long as she is looking for another place of her own and encourage her to maybe look to roommate with a good friend of hers, maybe. I knew this would be a risky move, but seeing how much it really takes for me, just know. I'll update later, but have peace of mind that I will not be taking out a mortgage for his family. Edit. The house would be in my name, on the deed. The cats are not destroying my apartment, as so many people are assuming, just the couch. I obviously care about these people, which is why I would even consider it. So please stop creating a story in your head where I am some sucker wanting to be scammed. Update. I'll be honest, I was not inclined to sign anything. Not because I didn't think his family would follow through or anything, I just knew I didn't know enough to make this decision. Homeownership is a distant thought right now at the wee age of 25. I came here hoping to see if this is something people actually do and what it would mean for me and my boyfriend if we did. The obvious risk was, what if we broke up? But I knew there was more than that and you all made that clear. First things first, no mortgage. I made that post yesterday morning and after reading through the comments that actually gave me insight into something like this, I realized, yeah, there's no way we can do this. I wish it was a viable option to solve their current problem, but it just isn't. Fortunately, by the time I got home after work and talked to my boyfriend about it, he also had realized this was not a good idea. Glad I had the foresight to make us wait before giving his family an answer. It just stunted too much of our own opportunities for the future, so we were both on the same page about it. Thank goodness. Someone mentioned that you can learn a lot about someone by how they handle the word no, and I can say that I didn't really learn anything, but just confirm suspicions I already had. His mom was very understanding, and I don't think she even understood what she was asking when it came up. After my boyfriend explained it to her, she told his dad, who's not his biological dad or even his stepdad, just his mom's longtime boyfriend, this matters for the next part. His dad did not take it very well. Before any of this, my boyfriend's parents told him they would help him get his credit up so that he could take on the loan for the house. They'd help him pay off his credit card and obviously front the money for the down payment. And they said even if we didn't help with the house, they'd still do that since he's helped so much already. As suspected though, once we made it clear that it was not happening with the mortgage and how it would damage our future chances at a home for ourselves, his dad wasn't happy. When his mom asked if they would still pay my boyfriend's credit card, his dad said no. He didn't help us, so we won't help him, is how he put it apparently. Yeah, like I said, my boyfriend's family is dysfunctional. I can't say I've ever had the most respect for his dad, but he's been there for most of my boyfriend's life. I have lots of thoughts of how this should go, but ultimately, we're just going to try problem solving in different ways. Definitely no rushing into quick fixes. Maybe be less ready to help so his dad can see what that's actually like. Also a note for all of you. I understand that the world is full of cruel people, but I think a lot of you miss the context of the situation when you cast judgment on his family's intentions. This is a family who has been displaced in a house fire. They're immigrants who aren't completely and perfectly savvy to all the logistics of buying a home. The reality for a lot of immigrants is that they do rush into terrible solutions because they don't always think that they have another option. They know that they have less resources because they lack citizen status, and it's not uncommon for kids to help their parents in extreme ways. And that doesn't just apply to immigrants. There are people all over the world taking extreme risks to try and better their situation. But since they have lived so long needing to think on their feet, they don't always feel like they can afford to look for other options. All that to say, practice a bit more compassion. I understand that this was too much of a risk for myself, but that's not going to stop me from helping them where I can. This is a terrible idea. Do not do it. They were renting before, they can find another place to rent. Do not make this your problem. Don't do it. I'm sorry for your boyfriend's family, but don't do it. This can easily get you trapped. If you consider it, meet with a lawyer and get a contract that's for your benefit and doesn't leave you with the cost for all of this. What if you do it and your boyfriend leaves anyway? Anyway, that sounds very fishy to me. If you were my client, I would tell you as an accountant to stay away from this. You are just the girlfriend and you are in a position easily to be used. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you put your name on the mortgage or not? Please let us know. I love compassion just as much as the next Karen, but sometimes you just gotta put your foot down. Am I the jerk for breaking up with my boyfriend and kicking him out 
because they wanted to let my brother go into the system? I, 26 female, recently lost my dad. He had a 15-year-old son, my half-brother Parker. No one in my family wants to take him in due to the fact that he's my dad's affair child, which he conceived during my late mother's cancer treatment. Despite this, I love Parker dearly. Regardless of my dad's massive being a jerk, Parker is my little brother. I work in a lucrative field and I own a nice condo, which my now ex-boyfriend Colin lived in with me rent-free. He did contribute to utilities and other expenses though. We have the perfect home for Parker and I can't for the life of me think of a single reason that we couldn't take him in. When I brought it up with Colin, he said that he didn't want to. I asked why and he said that he just doesn't feel like looking after a kid. I reminded him that Parker is 15 and won't need constant attention or babysitting or anything like that and Colin said that Parker would need emotional attention because he lost his father. I asked if he would really rather throw a 15-year-old into the foster system than deal with the emotional needs of said 15-year-old and Colin said, yes, while looking a bit shameful. I ended up giving him the ultimatum that Parker and I are a package deal, that I would be taking guardianship and that Parker would be moving in. I made it clear that the only choice Colin had was if he wanted to keep the relationship and stay in the house. He called me heartless for choosing my cheating dad's son over our five-year relationship. I called him heartless for talking that way about a kid and he looked at me astonished and went to start packing. I love my ex, I really do, but Parker comes first. He's my own flesh and blood, the only brother I have. Meanwhile, there are plenty of other men out there. Still, my heart is breaking now that Colin's moved out. I miss him but I don't regret my decision. Every time I think about what could have happened to my brother in foster care, I feel more love for my brother and less for Colin. My entire friend group has sided with Colin and pretty much ghosted me, which is what's given my pause here. Was I the jerk for what I did? OP, either your entire friend group are a bunch of jerks or Colin exaggerated the tale to make himself look better. Reach out to the person you were closest to among them and ask what he said, not the jerk. You're a real one and your brother is lucky to have you. Colin wanted to be your only dependent. He didn't want your little brother there because it would highlight how much of a man-child Colin is and how he's not pulling his weight. The writing is on the wall. Trying to stop you from taking in your brother was Colin's Hail Mary at preserving his meal ticket. Not wanting someone else's 15-year-old kid makes someone a man-child? Holy cow, this sub is crazy. Being willing to put your supposed loved one's little brother into the foster system because it might inconvenience you a little bit absolutely does. Helping raise a troubled 15-year-old isn't an inconvenience, especially when this economy means he probably has to stay longer at home and won't just leave at 18. It's a commitment. You're the jerk. I get where you're coming from, but you're the jerk for telling him that your brother comes first over a five-year relationship. You gave him no other choice than to leave. Now he was the jerk in how he came across, but you didn't give him any consideration in deciding how your relationship would evolve. No matter the situation, I would never have just sprung it on my partner. It would be a conversation. Then if we both felt that strongly, we'd end it. But I'd never force that decision on someone that I cared for. You're the jerk. Only sane comment here. If this is how OP acts in a relationship, then her ex-boyfriend just dodged a bullet if you ask me. Not the jerk, but y'all cut Colin some slack. They both want different things and that's okay. He does not want a kid at this point in his life. OP wants to take care of her little brother. They're just not compatible with what they want in their lives right now. It does not mean either one is wrong. Colin is a jerk for calling the kid names though. You're the jerk and I'm shocked people are trying to back your decision at all. You basically told your boyfriend that he's living with a kid whether he likes it or not and is going to disrupt each of your lives as you know it for the foreseeable future. You're really downplaying how much each of your lives change. That's huge. You also just showed your boyfriend that your love for him is less valuable to you than this kid who he has no affiliation with. If you would have married your boyfriend, would you have picked the kid over your own husband? Any partner that doesn't pick their significant other during tough times ain't worth it. When you're sitting alone after Parker leaves your apartment and your ex you love is married to someone else, you're going to feel like an idiot for this stupid ultimatum. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her ex-boyfriend? Please let us know. Insane religious aunt berates my cousin over her fiancé and is shocked when her son sides against her. Cast. We've got my innocent cousin, we've got me, we've got my cool cousin, we've got poor boyfriend, and entitled aunt. It was a nice winter evening. Entitled aunt had just come back from Dubai 
I was spending the weekend with innocent cousin, and my entire family has greeted her with an open heart, but my wounds with her are still fresh. Innocent cousin was also entitled aunt's niece, and cool cousin was her son. But innocent cousin saw her as a mother figure because her mother was always at work. Later during the night, innocent cousin decided to introduce her boyfriend to entitled aunt, but problems began to develop when they started talking about marriage. Entitled aunt. Oh, sweetie, you are such a lovely person. Where are you getting married? Poor boyfriend. Oh, we are getting married at a church. Excuse me? Innocent cousin. Please, entitled aunt. We all know what happened with you and OP, and we don't want that to happen again. For some reason, Entitled Ant started yelling again. If you don't want that to happen again, don't marry this jerk in a church. Poor boyfriend. Ma'am, please, I really love- If you really love her, you would leave her alone after I just warned you. Cool cousin. Mom, that's enough. Me. Yeah, we don't want to repeat what happened between me and you. If he wants to marry her in a church, so be it. I'm not going to listen to the talk of a pagan worshipper. You already cost me my relationship with your mother, you little crap. You're not going to do the same thing now. Cool Cousin was getting mad, and he started yelling. Enough, Mom. Stop hating other people for what they believe in. You have already ruined many relationships with many of our friends and family. Why can't you keep your mind open and accept the fact that people who are different also exist? At this point, the tension in the room can be cut with a knife. Innocent cousin. Please, cool cousin, that's enough. Cool cousin. No, that isn't enough. She already harmed OP, and she will be willing to do the same thing to you if you marry him. Then Entitled Aunt had the guts to smack cool cousin across the mouth for speaking the truth. You little jerk. I raised you for 18 years, and now you are supporting these people? Me. That's enough, Entitled Aunt. Don't you realize that the more you try to push your own agenda on others, the more you will be hated? Even your own son can't stand your actions. The son which you raised. It's about time someone called you out on your stupid actions. Poor boyfriend and innocent cousin are getting married whether you like it or not. Poor boyfriend, quietly. Thanks, man. Entitled aunt and cool cousin have finally calmed down. Cool cousin. Mom, just please for once open your mind. Please don't always be opposed to the actions of other people. Please, Mom, I implore you to work with us this time. Entitled Aunt. Sorry, cool cousin, I simply can't. And if you want to stay with OP, poor boyfriend, and innocent cousin, just know that I will never consider you to be my son. After Entitled Aunt said that, she cut off contact with her son, who was in college. This still remains a very touchy subject, and most of my family don't want to talk about it. Two months after the incident, poor boyfriend and innocent cousin got married in a church. Me and cool cousin remained close with them, and we occasionally hang out sometimes. Entitled aunt went to Dubai to live there with her husband. The rest of our families accepted the marriage without any problems. Menu changed? I won't be back. I used to work in a dine-in movie theater. Like, waiters come to your seat and take your order and bring you food, menus, and full meal sort of thing. We had a full bar out front in the lobby instead of a concession stand. We still had popcorn and candy though. Mind you, while the food is decent, it's just standard chain fare and most of it comes frozen. I've done every job in that building except for cooking and managing. At the point of time in this story, I was a bartender. Our menu had been mostly the same for the first six or so years on this particular chain being open. Typical menu, burgers and pizza, chicken tenders and salad sort of thing. Suddenly. Corporate stupidly decided to completely change it. We had new desserts and completely tossed out our old ones, new names for all our burgers, got rid of our homemade pizza dough and a lot of pizza favorites, etc. But the biggest change was that they eradicated the chicken tenders and the kids menu completely. Now kids had to order adult sized entrees, which we aren't exactly a kid friendly theater anyways. Anyone under 18 has to be with a parent more or less at all times and babies under three are just flat out not allowed in the building because we are, legally speaking, a bar. And the tendies were replaced with boneless wing bites. You get eight to 12 of these measly little balls of breaded chicken that are tossed in sauce with fries or a salad. Naturally, some customers were frustrated, but hey, corporate decision, I can't change it. Anyway, as the bartender during the week, I was in charge of selling tickets and handing out menus. During the weekdays, we rarely had a ticket seller on duty out front, so people are supposed to just walk in and purchase from me. 
A woman, who we will call Karen, and her 15 or so year old son, who we'll call Billy, come in. I know I've seen them in before. So they purchase tickets and Karen asks for a menu. I assented and launched into the little spiel management told me to give as I handed out the new menus. Me. No problem. Just to let you know, our menu has changed as of a few days ago. There are some awesome new items, but unfortunately, some of our old items have been replaced. Karen. Oh, well, that's okay. As long as I can still get chicken tenders, my son and I love them. That's the only reason we come here instead of the theater we actually live beside. She begins to flip through the menu. Me, cringing. Well, actually, the tenders are one of the items that have been replaced. We now have boneless wing bites. They- What do you mean? You can't take off the tenders. Billy. Mom, it's cool. We can just try the bites. They better be as good as the tenders. She's grumbling as she stalks towards their assigned theater, and her son gives me an apologetic glance as he follows behind her. They're the only people who end up in that theater. Again, weekday, slow. So when the ticket comes through, 10 minutes into the movie for a drink in that one, I know it's hers. To make it up to her that the tenders are gone, I make her drink look extra nice. Garnished all pretty, and the color, it was a blue raspberry spiked lemonade, was fantastic. I tried super hard as a newbie bartender to make this thing look epic. My manager took a photo of it when I was done. I was proud of that drink. I'm friends with her waiter too, so I tell the waiter to make sure the food comes out perfect. I just want to avoid any complaints at this point and give her a good experience since the only reason they came here was for the food, specifically the tenders that they both loved so much. About 20 minutes into the movie, 10 minutes after the drink, I see her food come past and go into the theater. Not even 5 minutes later, this woman comes storming out with a plate in her hand, drink in the other, and right up to where I am making drinks at the bar. She is fuming. Her son is on her tail and begging her to calm down. My little anxious heart jumps into my throat and then falls. I hate angry customers. She speaks before I can even open my mouth. Manager, now! Me. Yes, ma'am. I walk around the bar and to the manager's office and knock on their door. As I'm waiting, I glance over my shoulder and see her overturn her plate onto my drink station. She has gotten the boneless bites tossed in sauce, so now the area and mats on which I mix all cocktails is covered and I mean covered in spicy barbecue sauce and wings and fries. She pours her perfect drink on top of it right as the manager is coming out of the office. My manager is awesome. We'll call her Violet. She doesn't even look at me, just runs straight to the woman. I follow behind but keep a bit of a distance. Manager. Ma'am, what seems to be the problem here? Billy. Nothing, nothing. Mom and I are just leaving. Everything's okay. Karen. Shut up. That stupid bartender told me that the tenders are gone, and I had to order boneless wings instead. I ordered them, and they're gross, and she's so incompetent that she can't even make a darn mixed drink right. This drink is gross, and your standards for good food have dropped. I want to speak to corporate. Manager. Well, here's the hotline number for corporate, but my bartender did make that drink correctly. I'm sorry it wasn't up to your standards, clearly as you've smushed all of it into my bar. I just figured since this is her, points at me, fault, she can clean it up. Because I'm somehow at fault for the entire menu change countrywide. Sorry, I get paid $8 an hour, not my deal. Manager. The menu change was a corporate decision. My bartender didn't take the tenders off and she made that drink perfectly. I'm sorry you're this upset and I'll make sure corporate is aware. I'm leaving a Yelp review too. I'm never coming back here. Everyone will know not to come here anymore. My son is so disgusted with your food. Billy. Actually, I thought it was good, Mom. Please, it isn't that bad. Shut up! It's not good. You should be shut down. You don't care about your customers. I will never, ever come back here. Forget you. She's shrieking at this point. She reaches into her mess and picks up one of the bar mats she smeared food and drink onto and chucks it at me before running out of the store. Luckily, I dodged the mat, but food and drink dropped onto me and the floor now too. Her son, bless this poor kid, grabs a roll of napkins off the nearest rack. We have napkins and condiments and racks on the bar and starts trying to clean it up. He's crying quietly at this point and I don't blame him. I was on the brink of tears myself. This would have been so embarrassing to be that woman's kid in this situation. I get down next to him and gently take the napkins from him, telling him it's okay. I get it. My manager gave him two free tickets and said if him and someone older wanted to come see movies, she'd take care of his food too next time 
but his mom wasn't welcome back. We escorted him to the door where his mom had pulled up in her car and was slamming on the horn to get him to hurry up. They left. I cleaned it up and spent the rest of the day smelling like chicken and spiked lemonade, sticky and crumpy. Karen has tried to come back a few times, shockingly. Billy still shows up with his dad and older brother and is always the absolute sweetest kid to me and the waitstaff. But the woman has shown up alone and I always alert manager when she appears and she's always told to leave. Shockingly, she never throws a fit, just walks out. We never heard from corporate about her either. We still don't have chicken tenders. Crazy entitled parents called the cops on me because I refused to give them my car. Okay, a little bit of background. Where I live, there is a car show held in memory of someone in our town who passed of brain cancer and all proceeds go to cancer research. The show is held at a raceway nearby where everyone is welcoming and kids get in free while the parents have to pay $2 to get in. While the people entering the car show or are going to go around the track pay a premium. Now the story. I had entered my car into the car show and paid extra for it to go around the track during the time event. The car show part was a few hours before the warm up before time trials where everyone entering could do up to three practice laps to get used to the course. Now this is where the kid came in. Before the practice laps start, Entitled Kid said he liked my car, 1977 Leyland Mini, and started asking me about it and how I got it. All was normal. My family who was with me said I should let him sit in it and I agreed, but thought I could take it a step further and let him sit in the passenger seat during one of my warm up laps. I said to him I would let him go around the track with me on account I have his parents permission. When he heard that, his face lit up and he went to go get his parents. I thought all was normal until this happened. I was waiting around for the kid and his parents to show up. I hadn't moved from my spot and was doing some pre-checks on my car before I went out. 20 minutes had passed and I thought it was taking a little long for him to come back to give me an answer, but I thought I would wait a little longer just in case he got lost. Next thing I know, another 20 minutes have passed, then another 20 minutes. I had waited an hour for him to show back up and needed to get on the track. My car was ready half an hour ago and I had already gotten permission from the race organizers to have a passenger for one lap of the practice run. I had gotten tired and went to start the car when the kid showed up with his parents. They instantly asked me if I was up to something. By the way, I just turned 18 at the time and had my girlfriend with me at the race keeping track of my times. I told them I just wanted to give him a chance to see what it was like in a road race car just like how someone else let me when I was his age. After hearing that, they took a few steps back and started talking, but they took 10 minutes to do so. Tired of waiting, I told them it was final call. It's either a yes or a no, and I need to get on the track now. Entitled parents gave me a stink eye and finally said Entitled Kid could go. I had him get in and put the five point on and we headed for the first practice run. I told him to hold on and don't scream while I'm driving. He seemed to understand, but during the lap, he did the exact opposite. Once it was over, I had a headache and was still trying to be nice and I asked him if he had fun. He said he did and wanted to go again. I said from now on I had to be by myself and he started yelling at me and got out of the car, slamming the door behind me. I had had it at that point and just went to do my last two laps. Once they were over, we stopped for a quick break and this is where everything went down. First off, I had the entitled parents come up to me and yell at me for not letting him go again. I explained to them that I technically wasn't allowed and only got permission to do one lap with him. They were livid. Next thing I know, one of the organizers tells them their kid could go around the track in one of the rental track cars with his father, but it would cost $300. The entitled kid said no and that he wanted to go around in my car, but I said he couldn't. Next thing I know, entitled father is yelling how it's a ripoff and we are wasting the money on cancer research. I lost it at that point and told them to leave, but the organizer said what they said was fine and we don't need to make this work. I left with the organizer after that to avoid more of the confrontation. Skip forward half an hour and the time trial is about to start and guess who came back? Entitled mom. She said she was sorry and wanted to talk. I said later and she yells out $400. She was offering $400 for my entire car. I told her no and to get out of here. Next thing I know, the other entitled parent rocks up and says $700 for the car. I said no and that I have more money in my car than they probably have in their bank. The father responded saying that my sad rusted piece of crap is not worth more than a grand 
and that I would get more from crushing it than selling it. I told them to leave as they would not like what would happen next if they get in my way. I hopped in my car and drove off right past them. Once the time trial was over, I went to park in my spot to find my girlfriend and grandfather being talked to by the cops while the entitled parents were pointing at me. Two officers came over and told me to turn off my car and get out of the vehicle. I did so and asked what was going on. The entitled parents had called the cops claiming I stole their car. I told the cops the car was in my name and I have footage inside from a camera in my car that I use for studying my driving techniques. They asked to see the footage and I willingly showed them. They say I did nothing wrong and I had my parents bring down the proof of sale for my car. The entitled parents still tried to do me over until entitled father hit a bystander. The cops arrested him for assault and took the wife in as an accomplice. I haven't heard anything from them, but now one of the officers from the incident is a good friend of mine and we go to races together. So at least something good came out of this. Go ahead and do a chargeback, but you won't be getting a refund. Okay, I will. A couple of years ago, I ordered an express parcel delivery from the UK to the USA via one of those third-party parcel shipping companies. For those who are unfamiliar, they are a middleman and they hold huge accounts with UPS, DHL, FedEx, etc. They then offer cheaper parcel rates and pass some of this discount onto the customer. So I ordered an express 48-hour delivery with one of these delivery companies for my two parcels to the USA. This cost me around 100 pounds for the first two boxes and from experience using this delivery company in the past, they have a delivery guarantee which offers me a full refund of all carriage charges if any part of the shipment is not delivered within 48 hours. A few days later, I was told by my customer that the boxes had arrived two days late. Not a problem. I checked the tracking number and it had been held up at the UK-based air freight terminal, which entitled me to a full refund of the carriage charges. I then contacted the delivery company, but I was told that although I was fully entitled to a full refund, I'd have to speak to the third-party shipping company. I contacted them by phone and I was told that they don't issue refunds for delayed parcels. I explained that this was a guaranteed service and the delivery company said that I was entitled to a refund. At this point, I was passed on to a manager by the call center operative without even asking. The manager was very obnoxious and wasn't bothered that my parcel had been delayed. In his opinion, I shouldn't expect it to get there on time when I had paid such a low price. So you want a full refund just because your parcel is delayed? Yes, I do, because that is what was in the terms and conditions. But you didn't buy the extra insurance. No, I didn't, because the delivery already included 1,000 pounds of insurance anyway. Well, we don't do refunds for delayed parcels, and especially if you haven't paid for the insurance. At this point, I was getting pretty annoyed because he was making up this idea of buying insurance to cover for delays. The insurance only covered total loss and damage anyway. So I explained that if I didn't receive a refund, I would simply initiate a chargeback on my credit card for the payment. At this point, he raised his voice and told me, Fine, try to do a chargeback then. We will fight it and you won't get a refund. Yeah, your parcel was late, but that doesn't mean you get a free delivery. I ended the call and got straight on the phone to my credit card company. They went through a rigorous process with me and asked for a copy of the original invoice, the terms and conditions, etc. Within 24 hours, they had refunded the full amount back to my card and sent me a letter giving me the reasons they found the chargeback in my favor. It also explained that the merchant, the shipping company, had 30 days to contest the chargeback. However, 30 days came and went and the money was still showing as refunded. Six weeks later, I receive an email from their customer service team telling me that they were willing to give me a partial refund of 10% to compensate me for the delay. Obviously, somebody hadn't realized that I had initiated a chargeback and now it was too late. So I replied and politely explained that I was told by the manager, stating his name, to initiate a chargeback because their company doesn't issue refunds even when their terms and conditions say they do. Therefore, as far as I was concerned, the matter was now closed as my credit card company had given them 30 days to reply to the chargeback and they had not replied. Therefore, the chargeback was granted. Not only did I never hear anything back from them, but I haven't used this company since. The Girl Friday with the PhD takes over the business from the ungrateful owner. My spouse was the second person hired at a consulting company in a very specialized industry. 
In her 15 years with the firm, it grew to a respectable three office, eight to 10 employees at each location entity. She and the owner grew the business on the contacts, expertise, and presentation of my wife, to the extent that my wife's abilities and education were the main reason new business came through the door. Over the years, her scope of responsibility grew so that the owner was basically 75% absent and mostly unaware of day-to-day -day activity. As he got more and more removed from the business, he would make overtures that he would eventually retire and sell her the business. He was so dependent on her income generating that he took out a life insurance policy on her. I did not involve myself too much, but at a major industry dinner party I attended with her, he introduced my wife to the table as my girl Friday, basically a secretary, which was weird. Over the years, she tried to get an agreement in place to buy the firm, even if it was two years away. He always delayed and made promises but never followed through. I told her, this guy doesn't respect you or your contribution. He will never sell you the business because there is no reason to. He can make more money by stringing you along and essentially, you are the business. Why would he sell it to you? One day out of the blue, my wife received a raise and bonus, a very minor amount of money, and a contract that included a non-compete, non-disclosure agreement. After reading it, she realized that the owner was trying to lock her down from leaving for another firm. She had been getting feelers from other companies. To make things even more suspicious, she received a call from a competitor who said they were in final stages of due diligence and they wanted to meet her. The jerk was selling the company and didn't think to tell her or ask if she was interested in buying it. She ignored the agreement and there were no other agreements in place. She was totally free. My wife is extremely loyal. She has missed so many special days working for this guy, stuck around when they were wobbly, even skipped paychecks when there were tough financial times. She was furious, the absolute maddest I've ever seen her. We discussed starting her own firm and I asked, how much business is contractually obligated to stay there if you leave? It turned out that most agreements were either handshakes or 30 day at will. I also asked how many would leave with you. She said about 75%, including her biggest source of revenue who didn't even know the owner. In a very short time, my wife took a three week vacation. She had months of unused time, during which time she rented an office in the same building and made all the arrangements to set up a new shop. She agreed to leave any and all company property behind and do her best to give the old company no obvious ammo for litigation. She called her clients and said, I'm leaving. If you want to look into relocating your account with my new company, you'll need to quit the old one before we can discuss it. Most understood the implication. While she was on vacation, she received a panic call from her boss. We lost XYZ company. Do you know anything about it? She said, I'm sorry, but I just sent you an email. I've resigned. All my keys and company stuff is on my desk. Bye bye The new firm took basically 90% of the business and seamlessly transitioned into the same company as it was before, but with a new owner. Even most of the office staff would come aboard. Within a year, her old company closed down except for the small office her old boss ran. She sees him once in a while and he just scowls at her. Entitled man calls the cops on me for parking my truck properly. So this happened like a year ago. I'm doing truck driving in a moving company in the big cities and due to that I have to park in some crappy places due to customers living in crowded areas. I had a gig where I had to drive like 150 kilometers to another city to do moving services with a team for a company. So once we got there, we saw that there was construction work going on right next door, which resulted in part of the sidewalk being taken up. Also, because it had only one right lane, for safety reasons I had to park my truck partly on the sidewalk so that cars wouldn't run into each other. I had made sure that there was enough room for people to go through without having to get too close to the road. By the way, this is completely legal in my country. So it took about 30 minutes and there he was. This was around two hour packing job. This middle-aged guy on a bike ready to conquer the world, entitled Biker. First he came next to my truck and started taking pictures. I don't mind because this kind of behavior is nothing new to me, entitled Biker. Hey, you have to move your truck. Me. No man, I'm in the middle of the work and there was absolutely enough room that you could get through, entitled Biker. What if there comes someone with kids in a carriage? Cue a woman walking through with a kid carriage, looking confused because we both looked at her. I give Entitled Biker a smile. Never stopped working, by the way. You know that parking like this is illegal, right? Me. 
No, it isn't. You can look it up if you want. Move your truck. This is illegal. My coworkers come from the inside to bring more stuff to pack. Coworker 1. What's going on? Me. Some jerk is trying to make me move my truck, so nothing unusual. Just don't worry about it. Coworker 2. Don't you have anything better to do than harass people who are just trying to do their job? Entitled Biker. Move this truck or I'm going to call the police. We all just smile and leave him to his BS and keep working because we know that he can't do anything. The guy then proceeds to make a few phone calls, I assume to our company and the police, and keeps spewing his BS. We just ignore it because we have a lot of places to go and know we'll be doing at least two hours of overtime without him bothering us. Another 15 minutes go by. Entitled Biker. Move your truck or I'll call the police. Me, now smiling. Who did you just call now then? Entitled Biker goes silent for a minute and keeps on spewing about my illegal parking. Then I saw a police car drive behind his back. They looked at the situation, slowed down, smiled, and kept on driving. It was the middle of the day, so by now there were a lot of trucks all over the place taking up sidewalks in my area. Post trucks, vehicles, bringing food to stores, etc. So I tell him, Dude, can you just go harass the other truck drivers? Look around you, man. I'm not the only one parked like this. But either way, thanks for the laughs. I really enjoyed this. Entitled Biker is fuming at this point, so me and my coworkers give up and just tell him to buzz off. He finally decides to leave, but it isn't over yet. Entitled Biker decided to go and post about this incident to Facebook to all his 100 friends and my coworker spotted the post. He basically was rambling how I was a jerk for parking there and we were disrespectful and they just thanked me for the laughs they got out of me. At first I didn't pay any mind, but then he had also ranted about how he was almost fined for calling the emergency number on us and they warned Entitled Biker that if he called again, he would be fined for disrupting the emergency line or something. But yeah, happy ending. It was a long day, but we got a lot of good laughs about it and the construction workers also laughed. What the heck was that all about? And we even told our boss about it, who also laughed how some people can be so stupid. No problem, I'll print that video for you. And while I'm at it, I might have you fired as well. Context. This happened a few years ago. I was 18 and working as a receptionist for a community nursing center. As the youngest in the team by a long shot, the average age of employees being around 55 to 60, I was usually the one responsible for the computer stuff. Mostly just simple things, nothing a quick Google couldn't solve. The other staff members were wonderful and I learned a lot from working with them, except for the assistant manager, Karen. This woman was the bane of my existence. She was over 75, recently came out of a 15 year retirement as a receptionist and was armed with a certificate in business management from a four hour online class. She refused to learn basic computer skills such as Word or email stating that she didn't need to learn them again when she had others to do it for her, namely me. In a five hour shift, I would spend three hours just fielding her tasks. Needless to say, this came along with all the fun personality traits that make a manager from heck. At the start of my shift, I receive an email from Karen asking me to print the attached files. One was a PDF and the other was an MP4. So assuming she meant just the PDF, I take the printed copy to her. This is roughly how the exchange went. Karen, why do you only have one file? I sent two. Me, you want me to print an MP4? Isn't that what I asked? A monkey could do your job and probably better at it. Here, I'm pretty sure she laughed at her own joke. Me, desperate. Look, I don't think you understand. Don't try and teach me. Don't forget, I did your job for 20 years and now I could have you fired. Already over it and ready for some malicious compliance. Me, okay. Well, I've never printed this type of file before, so it might take a while. Karen interrupts. I don't care how long it takes. I'm your boss and I've told you to do this. Once it's done, you can move on to the other jobs. I'm grinning ear to ear at this point. I get back to my desk and send her an email summarizing our conversation and explicitly clarifying she wanted me to print an MP4, to which I got a snarky reply. Perfect. I spent the next four to five hours pausing the video every two to three frames, screenshotting it, pasting it to a Word document, and printing. The administrative tasks piled up, not that Karen noticed, because she mostly spent her time reading magazines or talking on the phone. I felt bad as this placed an extra load on the other receptionists, however, since Karen was universally hated, they gave me their blessing. Once complete, I took about 100 pages carefully held with clips to her desk and sweetly told her that I'd printed the file. She looked smug, 
until she saw what was in front of her, page after page of almost the same picture as the man moves through the video, some slightly blurry, all in full color. She was furious to say the least, but I was one hour overtime on my shift and Karen knew that would already cause her some issues, so she let me leave, though I knew it wasn't over yet. As expected, I get called into HR for a meeting the following week, where they accused me of wasting company time and not complying with management. I explained the situation in detail and showed them the email, including her awful reply. I also showed them a few more emails and texts where Karen used some particularly descriptive words to insult our staff members, including the very HR rep taking my interview. Turns out, this was the straw that broke the camel's back as Karen had multiple reports against her from other staff members, and she had been driving HR insane with her own complaints. She lost her job the following week. The best part is that this happened on a Sunday, where I got double pay. I took some of that sweet overtime cash and brought in cupcakes to work once Karen was gone. I said it was an end of week treat, but we all knew what we were celebrating. The HR rep seemed to particularly enjoy hers. Entitled Grandmother Thinks It's Okay To Take My Stuff Without My Permission Back when I was a freshman in high school, my grandmother thought that it would be a good idea to take my belongings without informing me while I was at school. To elaborate, I had a small table with cubby holes in it that I kept belongings in that were important to me. I had autographs, signed art, and awards I had earned over the years in those cubby holes. I came home from school to go to my room only to see that the table had been replaced with an enormous dresser. Confused and concerned for my belongings, I went to confront my grandmother about where everything went. This was the conversation that followed. We've got entitled grandmother, we've got me, we've got oblivious grandfather who doesn't understand why I was so upset. Me. Hey, grandma, what happened to my table in my room? Grandma. Oh, I took it out and put it out on the porch for a place to put my shoes. I hope you don't mind, OP. I thought she was joking because why would anyone use a table as a shoe rack? We already had several by the front door and I didn't think she was serious, but I went out to the porch and sure enough, there it was. Decorated with shoes, potted plants, and empty mason jars. I then come back inside to ask where my belongings were and what she did with them. Me. If you wanted my table, you could have asked when I got home. Also, where's my stuff that was in it? At this point, my entitled grandmother starts to get defensive and tries to avoid my questioning. Grandma. I wasn't going to wait for you all day to come home. I have a lot of work to do, and you should feel grateful that I replaced your table with a desk. Yeah, she thought that the dresser that she got me was a desk. I looked at her, still trying to decide if she was serious or not. And she was. I try to explain to her that a desk has leg room and doesn't have the drawer that a dresser has for you to put clothes in. She wasn't hearing it. However, I wasn't either and continued to ask her where my belongings were until she finally gave in and told me. Grandma, why do you care so much about those things? It was only several awards and other crap. I had to do something with them in order to move the table, so I put them in a box while you were at school and moved them to storage. Me, what the heck? You took my stuff and put it in a box without telling me? Don't use that type of language in my house. I'm going to smack the heck out of you if you use it again. Me, I don't give a hoot if you smack me. You took my crap without even letting me look through the box to see if I wanted to keep anything. Not long after my grandmother and I started arguing, my grandfather comes into the room after hearing us arguing outside. He had been on the phone with a client of his, and as soon as the client hung up, he came in to see what was going on. Oblivious Grandpa OP and Entitled Grandma, what are you arguing about this time? For context, my grandmother and I never got along well, and this only tipped the boat even more into the water. Me She took my table and crap that was inside it to use it as a shoe rack when she already has three of them by the front door. Grandpa OP, you shouldn't talk to your entitled grandmother like that. I've noticed how disrespectful you've been getting around the house towards her, and you need to straighten up your act. Upon hearing this, Entitled Grandma tries to play the victim card and starts tearing up, voice cracking and everything. Entitled Grandma. OP, why are you always so angry at me? Have I not done enough for you already? What did I do to deserve this kind of treatment from you? Please tell me. Me. Don't pull that crap with me, Grandma. 
You've been doing it every time I catch you doing something crappy, just so you don't have to take responsibility. My grandpa gets furious at this point with me. He disregards the fact that his wife had stolen my belongings and starts going off at me. Grandpa. OP, look what you've done. You need to learn to respect your elders. You've always been a good granddaughter, but this is unacceptable. I can't believe how you're displaying yourself right now. This is my household, and you are only 15. Me. 15 or not. She, entitled Grandma, stole stuff that was important to me. How would you feel if I went into your room, took your clothes and stuff out of it, stuck it in a box while you were out of town, and told you that I put it in a storage room, and replaced your furniture with something else that serves no use to you? Grandma. Well, I would feel grateful that someone would take their time to think of me and spend money on me. Grandpa. See, entitled grandma is thankful for things in her life. Why can't you be OP? You need to learn how to be thankful for what others have done for you in life. Otherwise, you won't get anywhere. What do you think your boss would say if you spoke like this to him? Me. I think he'd have some common sense to know that you shouldn't steal other people's stuff, even if they aren't in the room. I had ended up storming off and could hear Grandpa and Grandma talking about how rude I was. The storage area wasn't too far from my house, only down the road, so I walked down there the next day and couldn't find the box my grandmother was talking about. To this day, every time I try to go and see if I can find the box, I believe that my entitled grandmother threw it away and tried to come up with something that would get me to stop questioning her. I've seen all your comments, and I can understand why you suggested that I need to get over it. However, I will say while this is true, I had important belongings of mine that were taken away without my knowledge. The most important being my signed artwork I have done over the years and given to actors to sign while at conventions. I don't think I can get over losing those. What would you do if you were in this situation? What would you say to your grandma and how would you act towards her? Please let me know in the comments. Entitled Neighbor Makes a Huge Mistake This was about 25 years ago, so I was about 8 years old and we had just moved into a 150-year-old house that was in need of major repairs. My dad, thinking ahead, knew he would need a large garage slash workshop to really get started on the renovations properly. On the edge of our yard was an ancient barn that was falling apart and needed to be torn down. My dad figured this was the best place to build his new workshop, so that was the plan. We had met and were on good terms with all of the neighbors at that point. When the plans for the new workshop were finished, my parents went around to all the neighbors as a courtesy to show them the plans and get their blessing. The neighbors whose property the current barn and new workshop would border, I'll call them the Peters, were concerned about the height. The existing barn was 16 feet high and they asked if we could build it to only one story, 12 feet max, as to not block the sun in their yard. Sure, no problem. My parents agreed. They wanted to go two stories for extra storage, but just one wasn't a deal breaker. So the old barn was torn down and the foundation laid for the new one. During that time, there was a falling out with the Peters and my parents. I'm not sure what happened, but it turned nasty. One day, my brother and I were playing street hockey and Mr. Peters came out yelling at us. Get off the road. You have to earn your place in this town. Upon hearing this, my mom had to physically restrain my dad from going over and beating him up. Eventually, he cooled off and started on his plan. The plans for one story went out the window. Soon, the new garage that was only supposed to be one story gained a second in the blueprints. If they were going to act like this with us kids, my dad would build what he wanted. As construction started, the Peters came over to ask why there were two stories being built and were told to go forget themselves. We didn't hear from them again until the roof started to go on. The bylaws of the township limited all out structures to 24 feet high. The Peters called the township and then a building inspector, claiming that the new garage was over 24 feet high. If it was over height, the entire thing would have to be torn down and rebuilt, costing us tens of thousands of dollars. I remember the Peters standing there, watching the inspector, with smug looks on their faces. Two days later, we got the final report back from the township inspector. 23 feet, 11 inches, just as my dad had drawn up in his new plans. He sent me up on the roof of the garage, just plywood, no singles yet, with some spray paint and had me write, 23 feet 11 inches, height approved, and two foot high neon orange letters across the entire roof, 
facing their yard and house. Not only did the garage block all sunlight from reaching their yard, but my dad waited until everything else was done before he shingled that side of the roof. They had to stare at those neon orange letters for almost three years. We didn't hear a peep from them for the next 10 years until they moved. I want a Baconator now. So I used to work at a famous fast food chain. It was my first job and I hated it. Fast food workers get so much crap from people. I have recently moved over to the store next to the restaurant, a gas station, and I love it there. My boyfriend and I went to the restaurant for lunch one day. He used to work there too. It's where we met. We got our food and sat down at a table we used to always sit at and begin eating and chatting, even taking some pictures when I feel a hard tap on my shoulder. Now, I've read some stories on here and have worked in this place enough to know a Karen when I see one, so I breathed out a breath. Yes, the Karen sighs and folds her arms across her chest. I want a Baconator. My boyfriend stops eating and looks up. I'm sorry, but we don't work here. I want to note that I was in blue jeans and an overly big blue and red wolf sweatshirt, my boyfriend's, and he was wearing blue jeans and a yellow t-shirt and a Chevrolet hat. She scowls and points at me. Yes, you do. I've seen you behind the counter. Now get me my Baconator and a side of fries and make that fresh. No tomato and no pickles. I now recognize the lady as one that always had to fuss about everything and made my job 11 times harder. I used to work here, but I don't anymore. Please leave us alone. We are trying to enjoy our lunch. I turn around only to get slapped on the back of my head and I freeze. Give me my Baconator! I see my boyfriend tense out of the corner of my eye before he slowly turns around and stands to his full six foot four height, towering over the lady. Get the heck away from us before I do something I really don't want to do. His voice is cold as he glares down at her. He is visibly shaking in rage. I don't take being touched well, especially hit. Even light taps can send me into a panic because of my past, and he knows this. The lady stares wide-eyed at him before scurrying over to the counter. He sits down, thinking it's over, but I know this woman, and she is not done yet. I watch as the manager in charge, one of my favorites, love her, comes over with a confused look. I heard that you assaulted someone? My boyfriend snorts and looks at her. She assaulted us. Look at the cameras. The manager's eyes slide over to me, to which I nod. She goes back behind the counter to look at the cameras, and she soon comes out on the phone. Apparently, she also assaulted the employee behind the counter by throwing a drink at him, so the police were called. I watched with satisfaction as my manager told her that she was banned and as she was escorted out. None of us pressed charges just because we didn't want to deal with her anymore. Speaking of Baconators, what's your favorite fast food place? I'm so hungry right now and I'd love to hear from you. No, I won't show you my ID even though it'll take two seconds. This was my first time meeting a Karen and I thought I would share it. I used to work for a big UK fashion retail brand and policy at the time was to ask the customer for a form of ID to confirm that the name on the online order was the same on the ID. The reason for this was to ensure that the person collecting the parcel was the right person and also for security reasons due to certain customers having a credit account with the store. Anyway, it begins. We've got Kevin, the male customer, and Karen, the female customer. Kevin. Hey there, I'm here to pick up an order. Me. Yeah, that's no problem. Can I take your reference number, please? Sure, no problem. It's 123456. Me. That's great. While that's searching in our system, do you have a form of ID on you? I do. Is a driver's license okay? Me. Yeah, that's perfect. I look at his license and confirm his name to the name on the order. I've confirmed the Kevin's order, and as I go to get it, I notice Karen waiting on the end of the till. I see she has no clothing items in her hand, so assume she's also collecting a parcel. We use a zebra device, so I'm able to collect more than one customer's order at a time, and so begins my endeavor with Karen. Me. Hello, are you also collecting a parcel? Karen. I am, yeah. Me. That's perfect. Do you have your reference number with you? Nope. I used my credit account with the store. She gets out her purse and takes out her store card and shows it to me. I scan it and her order comes up. Now, when someone comes in and collects an order with their credit account, we were told to always ask for ID 
as fraud could take place, and this could ruin the customer's credit rating, among other things. I read her name off of the device I have. Me. Mrs. Karen? Oh yes, that's me. Me. Okay, do you have a form of ID to confirm your identity? No! I was confused here, because whenever someone picks up an order, they always get a text or email to confirm it's in store and ready for pickup. And in this text or email, it always says, please bring a form of ID. I say to her, sorry? No, I don't want to. Me, it's just to confirm that you are the right and correct person to pick up the parcel. I don't care. I don't want to show you my ID. I've shopped with this company for 30 years, and not once have I been asked for an ID. I was a customer here when the store was still at its old location, and they never asked me for an ID. Me, it can be anything, even a bank card, as long as it's got your name on it. No, I don't want to. Do I have to tell you again? Me, okay, sorry. Now, I was fairly new at the time, so was super confused and somewhat anxious as I wasn't too sure what to do. Another member of staff comes over and asks if I'm okay, and I just tell her, yeah, and that I can sort it. I go and get the two customer parcels, and one thing we can do is ask the customer to confirm their postcode for us as it's printed onto the parcel. Although this should be the last method of customer confirmation as getting a postcode for something and their name is easy. So I go back out onto the shop floor and back to the till point. Me, can you confirm your postcode for me? Karen scoffs. Who, him or me? Me, standing right in front of her, clearly speaking to her. Um, his. Did that to make her wait longer. So I hand the parcel over to the guy and he leaves. Me, now can I have your postcode please? AB1234C. There you go, bye. So yeah, that's it. She was extremely rude, and I honestly couldn't care if she hadn't been asked before. I told her that it was policy, and that she should have been asked for ID. Plus, it would have been so easy to take out her ID. It was in her open purse, in her hand. I found out after from my colleague that she called me pathetic and stupid while I was getting her parcel, and that she was complaining about being asked for her ID. Entitled Mother Lets Her Kids Steal My Blind Cane so a bit of backstory, I am a 28 year old woman who just recently went fully blind. When I was a teenager, I volunteered with my local youth group to help rebuild Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina. And while down there, I picked up a fungal parasite called histoplasmosis that over a decade migrated to my eyes and slowly caused blindness. I've been totally blind for about a year now, so I'm pretty new to it, but I digress. When I first went blind, I barely left the house and was afraid to go out in public. I felt like everyone was staring at me and in all honesty, I barely knew what I was doing. The transition had been difficult and I didn't have any support group to teach me. One day, my husband asks if I can take an Uber down to the bank and deposit a rent check and I reluctantly agree. While out, he messages again and reminds me that we're out of a few crucial groceries. There was a Walmart grocery literally across the street from the bank so I figure everything in life is an experience and I'll have to learn how to shop alone eventually, so why not? Everything was fine at first and I was only grabbing a few things so I didn't need a card. I was using my cane and what little echolocation skills I had at the time to get around, but was still bumping into things as we blind tend to do sometimes. My cane suddenly hit something a bit softer and I figured maybe I had whacked someone's leg and I apologize. Cue Entitled Kid and Entitled Mother me. Shoot, I'm sorry. Entitled mom. Hey, you just hit my son. Me. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I didn't see him there. Entitled mom begins yelling. How could you not see him? He's clearly right here. Now, I'm fully blind, so I don't wear sunglasses. Mostly because I can't afford a good UV blocking pair, but also I'm not ever looking for pity or to play the part of a generic blind person. I just want to be treated like a normal person, but I do understand her confusion as blindness is a spectrum, so I try to calmly explain. Me. Ma'am, I'm blind. I can't see anything, let alone your son. That's why I have to use the cane so I can get around without she cuts me off. If you're blind, why aren't you wearing big sunglasses? Now, as a blind person, I get a lot of stupid questions, but I understand a lot of them are just people who don't know better. 
so I try to happily answer as many as I can. Me, those are really expensive, around $200 for a good pair, and I really don't need any inside. You're not blind, you're faking it. Here is where my blood starts to boil. I can't think of any reason someone would want to pretend to be blind. It's an actual heck, and nothing upsets me more than when someone calls me a liar when I'm not. Just as I'm about to respond, I feel a tug, and before I blink, I realize this little jerk spawn has snatched my $100 cane from my hands. For those of you who don't understand, that's like if you're shopping and suddenly the power goes out and you can't see a single light. Without my cane, I can barely move at all without crashing into anything. My voice gets shaky as I begin to panic. Please give that back. I really do need it. No, you don't, you liar. My son deserves to play with this more than you. I hear her shuffle away and my expensive cane cracking into metal displays and such as they leave. I start crying and waving my arms in front of me to grab onto something, anything, and end up crashing and falling into a center aisle display, making a loud scene. Without fail, I somewhat curl into a ball and cry. I'm alone in public, in the dark, and I had no idea what to do. Suddenly I feel a hand on my shoulder and a man's voice, we'll call him Awesome Guy, asks if I'm okay and tells me to stay right there. I do, but begin to at least sit up and listen. This man must have been tall and built like a tank because his footsteps sounded like a giant and I felt a suction of wind when he took off. Maybe about 30 or 40 feet away, I hear this loud bellowing like an angry lion and a loud crash. Then before I know it, the man is back and helping me to my feet. He takes my hand and puts my cane into my palm and helps me pick up the items I dropped when I fell into the display. Me wiping tears from my cheeks. Thank you, thank you so much. I didn't know how to handle that. Awesome guy. Don't worry about it. Some people are just monsters. This guy restored my faith in humanity and even helped me finish shopping and helped me out of the store. As we're leaving, I can hear the familiar screeching of Entitled Mom. Something about Awesome Guy grabbing the cane and pulling it, flinging her little jerk into a shopping cart. I don't know if she was exaggerating or not, but it would explain the crash I heard. It's easy to feel alone in a world without sight, but even through the sheer terror of being stripped of my cane, at least I know now that there are people willing to stand up for me when I need it. Entitled parent comes in after closing, gets caught stealing, and complains about being a single mom. Closing the store, reaching to lock the front door, an entitled parent runs inside, says she just needs a couple things for her kids. Okay, we'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Continue closing duties, notice her watching us and moving to hide behind end caps when she sees us look up. Got a bad feeling about her. Circle the store and see she has a full cart and is sweeping more out of the dairy case into it. She is actually clearing whole shelves of things like cheese and yogurt into the cart. She tries to get away when I approach her, but the cart is too heavy for her to push it fast. I catch up with her and tell her the store is closed and she must go to the register now because we need to disinfect everything. She goes to the self-checkout. We see her make the scanning motion, but not scanning the items and then putting them in a bag in her cart. We call her out on this. She feigns ignorance. We make her scan it again. We get attitude. She gets done scanning. We're pretty sure she phantom scanned more items, but we were distracted doing closing work. She has a big total, over $200. She pulls out a payment method that is clearly noted in the checkout area we do not accept. She starts to throw an entitled parent fit, but she is put in her place about coming in after hours and knowing we don't take her payment method. More attitude. We get the manager on duty to try to help her. Between cash and debit and credit cards, she gets her balance to just under $100. Manager gives her the remaining balance and she asks, So what? I gotta pay that too? Manager tells her yes. She eyes the door. No way she can push the heavy cart fast enough to beat us to the door. Manager basically says that to her. And I add, Yeah, and she's locked in too. Remember, we were locking up, so she can't get out unless we unlock the doors with a key. We can tell something is wrong. She's too nervous. I say, she should just return the items until she's paid. Manager smiles and agrees, starts ringing returns. Entitled parent is complaining we should just let her leave. It doesn't take long to find out why she's so nervous. Quite a bit of her stuff won't ring up because it's not on the receipt. She had tried refusing to hand over the paper receipt 
not knowing that the manager has it up on his computer screen. Of course, none of the expensive baby slash kid stuff was rung in. Formula, diapers, wipes, etc. She is so busted. She thinks she's going to jail, but we know the cops won't come out unless someone is hurt. But we talk about the cops we know while trying to get her total down, just to wind her up more. She is finally paid in full. Over $200 worth of items have to be returned to stock. She paid for $100, tried to steal $100, and we returned $100. This jerk came into a closed store, tried to steal $100 worth of merchandise, and wanted to be let off the hook for paying what she kept. I got the pleasure of walking her to the doors. I made sure she went out the door furthest from her car. While walking there, she is complaining about how we treated her and saying she's a single mom. That crap don't flush with me. I say, so, you're home all day with the kids? She said she is. Then I say, next time, come in earlier. And by the way, You'll be using a cashier from now on. No more self-checkout for you. Her jaw dropped. She went to say something else, but I shut the door in her face and locked it again. Had to get back inside and put her stuff back in the cooler. How do you get caught stealing and then complain the store takes the stuff off you? Entitlement. Entitled parents think I should give them thousands of dollars and they never even thank me. My parents requested I come home during all of this mess which has been the biggest mistake of my life. Seriously, it was an awful move, and once I'm out of here, I am never speaking to these people again. I have a good amount of money coming in because I work my butt off, and some projects are finally paying off. When I first got here several weeks ago, they started requesting I pay random bills. My mom said, that would be awesome, and faked being happy when I know now she clearly expected to make bank off of me car insurance, cell phone bills, house payments, etc. I've been happily paying them. Not only have they not said thank you once, which I wouldn't mind if they just showed me some sort of not negative emotion, but they are constantly making me wait several days to pay these bills and being weirdly aggressive about it. The logical next step is to not pay the bills, right? Except when I said I wouldn't help if it bothered them, my stepdad flipped crap and called me a freeloader. So my taxes came and I decided to give my mom $400. Because I have good money coming in, I also ordered random odds and ends that I need slash one. Not only was I not told thank you for the $400, but now as my things come in every time something arrives in the mail, they both get passive aggressive. It doesn't matter if it's a $9 skin cream, I might as well have lavished myself with gold by the way they overreact. I also told my mom because I made under enough to get the $1,200, when it comes, I'm going to give her $500. When I told her this, she got weirdly passive aggressive about it again, and I could tell that she wants the whole $1,200. I don't get it. They make good money. They both just got more than me back in taxes. Also does not help that they have done nothing but crap on me and ride me since I got here treating me like trash, even recruiting my brother into it. Seriously, they've made me feel lower than dirt. I'm crying myself to sleep every night because of how they're treating me every day. And just now, my stepdad messaged me that I need to knock off the spending spree and grow up. Excuse me, because I know they raised me. But in my world, if anyone happily gives you thousands in cash without complaint, you at least be nice to them. But with them, they clearly want every penny I have and to treat me like trash. I own a home, I have a life, I have a career. I don't need to grow up, I'm grown. I would dip today if my state wasn't under a stay at home order and if I wasn't so worried about my mom who works with the public. Edit. We live in a state where it's dirt cheap to live. Just to really put an emphasis on how crappy it is that my thousands haven't been enough money for them. The money I've spent at one month here would pay someone's rent in this state for five months. I've given them a lot. I think I deserve a good job or a thank you for helping. All I want is for them to show me some kind of love. Mom thought a new vacuum was more important than my college. This took place a few years ago when I was still in college for my bachelor's degree. For several years, I waitressed slash cleaned houses and really pinched pennies, putting any extra money into savings for college. I didn't qualify for any assistance because my parents claimed me as a dependent and they made too much money. But I am very lucky to not have student loans having saved enough from working to pay as I went. The last year of my bachelor's degree, I was hardly living at home. I lived with my boyfriend most of the time, helping with those expenses. 
I also helped with things around the house, particularly for my mom who lived alone, paid all of my own bills like car insurance and such, and at this point was buying all of my own food and toiletries. I'm explaining all of this for background, not at all to complain because I was happy to do so and as an adult who was able, I felt it was my responsibility. Around world tax season and I approached my mom, asking her if she could not claim me on her taxes this time, considering everything stated above. Her and my dad took turns each year claiming my brother and I on their taxes as dependents. I told her not being claimed would really help out with getting money for college to finish up my final year as the money I saved was pretty much depleted. She agreed without any issues and I couldn't have been happier. I don't remember specifics but I was having some issues with financial forms online and expressed my worries that I was having trouble figuring it out. Two days later and with help from a university counselor, it was all good and well. I don't even think a full week passed between our initial conversation and the conversation below and the deadline for taxes was still a good ways off. I came to my mom's house, let her know I'd gotten it figured out and would be submitting my paperwork. She says, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said it wasn't going to work out. Confused at her apology, I said, I was having difficulties, but I got some help and it's fine now. But I didn't think it would work, so I claimed you on my taxes and turned them in yesterday. I was quiet for a minute. She couldn't have followed up with me in those couple of days to confirm it wouldn't work out before filing? It isn't like I kept her waiting for weeks. Okay, whatever, it can still be okay. So I asked her if she could give me the money that she would get from claiming me since she wouldn't have been expecting it this time around anyway and it would really help me. I pointed out how I pay for all my own things and don't really live at home anymore and that I've worked so hard. Well honey, really I'm so tight on money right now, I really could use the money. I know I don't talk finances with you a whole lot, but honestly this would help me. I was dumbfounded and then quietly furious, but ultimately thought I don't want my mom to struggle so it's okay, I'll figure it out. I tried really hard to not let it bother me until her tax money came in and she bought over $1,000 worth of small home appliances, the most expensive being a vacuum cleaner when hers worked perfectly fine. In fact, she offered me her old one because it works perfectly fine, I just wanted an upgrade. In the end, my dad and stepmom felt so bad for me in this situation, they gave me a couple hundred dollars to put towards school, which was a blessing I didn't expect but was so grateful for, though it barely made a dent in college tuition. Basically, that's where the story ends. I never really talk to my mom anymore about it because she has done so much that's hurt me. I try to pick my battles. It was validation enough for me that the other people in my life saw it was wrong too. Karen gets called out by her name. At the store this past Sunday with a friend of mine, we both were waiting in line to buy stuff and our register was pretty close to the customer service desk. My friend is staring at the customer service desk and then nudges me to look. Woman is at customer service desk complaining. She's going on and on about not being able to return the two packages of toilet paper that she had bought two months ago. Store policy was that they were not accepting returns for that item along with disinfecting wipes, rubbing alcohol and other cleaning supplies. So this woman looks like a classic Karen in every single way right down to the frosted bobbed hair. It truly was the perfect Karen cut. Also in yoga pants. So yeah, on point. So this discussion between the hapless store employee and Karen is getting ugly. Store employee is no match for Karen who is well versed in Karen language and using the terms to get her way. Such as, why is the store policy only applicable to those items? And I buy stuff here all the time and have never seen that sign. And I have a store credit card here and have been here for over 10 years. I give you so much business and I am going to cancel my card if you don't allow me to return these items. Then Karen being Karen goes right for the jugular. I need to speak to your manager right now. My friend who is with me is a server at a pretty popular restaurant in the same city. I'm a bartender but not at the same restaurant. She knows the woman complaining. My friend starts telling me that the woman complaining is her worst nightmare. She would always come into the restaurant with her two kids and demand all sorts of special stuff for free, then complain about not taking some type of coupon or membership discount card. And the best part, this woman's name really is Karen. So my friend yells over to her, Hey Karen, how are you? To which the woman explodes, 
How do you know my name is Karen? Who the heck are you? Just mind your own business and stop acting like you know me. Don't call me by my name like you know me. Ugh. So a few of the other employees are now snickering to themselves, including the cashier that is our cashier for our line, who says to us, Seriously? Is her name really Karen? To which my friend tells her, yes, absolutely, and she is a total 100% Karen. My friend then tells the cashier that this woman comes into her restaurant and pulls the same crap all the time, and at least now, she knows that it isn't just her that is the target of her missives. We stick around to see if Karen gets her way because, well, I insisted to see the outcome because I wanted Karma to kick Karen's butt. Yup, Karma kicked Karen's butt in this case as the store refuses to return the toilet paper and recommended she donates it to charity or a shelter or a community group that provides necessities to those in need. The manager even told Karen that if she wanted to leave it at the store, he would make sure it got to a group that needed it more than she did. Karen exploded at that point as she dragged the toilet paper back to her car. Total karma payback. Worth the wait to see. My friend can't wait to see Karen back after the restaurant reopens as she's planning on bringing a roll of toilet paper to the table along with the menu for Karen as a fun new promotion for the restaurant reopening. Apparently, not doing something that isn't your job is rude. Okay, so I work in a bar. A party of office workers from across the road came in one night. Most of them are okay. One of them, a woman who I'll call Sarah from now on, was pretty drunk. At around 11 p.m., she asks me for a baked snack that was no longer sold. I told her that we didn't have any. Confused, she said, but I was here a few months ago and you had them. I explained that we stopped selling them. Again, she says, but you used to sell them. Again, I explained that we don't sell them anymore. Completely serious, she says, can you make me one? I couldn't believe the cheek of this lady. Incredulously, I said, make you one. I'm a bartender, not a cook, and the kitchen's closed for the night. The cook had left over an hour ago, and even if by chance she was still hanging around, there was no reason why she or I should go out of our way for this woman child. Refusing to relent, Sarah goes, well, can't you just defrost some? I explained to her that the cook, who had gone home an hour ago, used to make these savory pastries from scratch. There's nothing to defrost. I told her that if she's really hungry, the supermarket, which is a five minute walk away, sells the snack she's after and that they shut down at midnight. Sarah, you're really rude. Me, am I? What have I possibly said or done that can be considered rude? It's not what you said, it's your demeanor. Me, my demeanor? What about my demeanor? Sarah, you're not being very accommodating. You're very cold. You're not smiling. Me, resisting the urge to call her a toxic jerk. I'm not really a smiler. Well then, maybe you shouldn't be working here. I expect better than this. My company, it's not her company. She's just an employee. Spends a lot of money here. I don't like your attitude. Me, other customers don't have a problem with me. Most of them actually find me hilarious. I want to see your manager. She actually said this. Me. The manager's currently busy. This wasn't a lie. Sarah. What's your name? Me. You don't need to know my name. She kept on harassing me for my name, but I wouldn't give it to her because I didn't want to. Plus, I was enjoying watching her growing frustration. I sent the security man a text telling him to not tell her my name. I stayed stoic because I refused to give people like this the satisfaction of reacting. When they can't get a rise out of you, these people always get angry, which is hilarious. After a bit more BS playing the amateur shrink, she said, What happened to you that's made you like this? Something must have gone seriously wrong in your life to make you like this. I held my tongue, but my assessment of her was that she comes from a wealthy family and her parents spoil her. She followed me around the place, videoing me while ranting, threatening to have me fired, etc. This made me angry, but I didn't react or say anything. Karen wants me to work there, but I don't. Our cast. We've got myself. We've got Karen. We've got the obese kid. He's around 10 to 12. We've got the store clerk. I live way out of town, but work in town, so I frequently go into stores before or after work while dressed in my work clothes. Since this saves me a two-hour round trip to go home and change, this will become important later. Last fall, I was looking for a washing machine and found a really nice one marked down to less than half price. I found a sales clerk who was helping a man and a lady, 
and when he looked in my direction, I indicated that I would like to purchase the washing machine when he was finished with his other customers and had him in it. He nodded. I went over to the washing machine to wait for him so I could keep first dibs on buying it. A woman, who will be known as Karen, with a very obese kid in tow, came up to me and asked me for help. No biggie, this has happened to me before. I smiled and told her that I don't work there. She got irritated and told me she couldn't find anybody who worked there. The sales clerk was maybe 10 feet away and that she wanted me to work there. I said, but I don't work here. Then she said, but I need help with a dishwasher. I told her that I know nothing about their dishwashers and don't even own a dishwasher and that she would need to ask someone who actually does work there. She glared at me and was about to leave when she glanced at my shirt and gasped. She was quiet for a few seconds, but it was just an intake of air before I was treated to one of those famous Karen at full volume in person. She pointed to my shirt and said, What do you mean you don't work here? You do do work here, and I want your help right now. That's enough of your crap. I looked at her calmly and said, Ma'am, this, pointing to the embroidery on my shirt, says name of grocery store. You are in name of hardware store. I do not work here. But she wasn't having any of it and let loose at me at full volume, yelling about being a mother and having her kid with her and how I needed to stop messing around and help her because she has a kid. Poor kid looked embarrassed. I actually felt sorry for him because he must have dealt with her nonsense every day. Karen stomped away yelling about making a complaint and then for some reason she turned around and came back to glare at me. I told her again that I do not work there and that she would simply have to find someone who does work there to help her. She kept complaining and telling her kid how he would have to wait since I refused to help her, yelled at me about how she is a mother and her time is important, and on and on. After a few minutes, she quieted down and stood between me and the dishwashers, glaring at me. I couldn't resist. I had to give her my sweetest smile and said, Oh, and when that clerk is finished with the people he's helping, I'm next. She let out an epic, grabbed her kid by the arm, and stomped off. As soon as he saw that Karen was gone, the store clerk quit talking to the other customers who he had been halfway hiding behind, made sure she was out of sight, then seeing that it was now safe, came over to help me. The time that security prevented me from doing my job. I used to work as an entertainment lighting electrician and console programmer. One of my busiest times of year was working the New York Fashion Week, both spring and fall. It was a lot of organized chaos, but I enjoyed my time there. The most important place backstage is the hair and makeup stations in the dressing rooms, rows of tables with mirrors and lights, with power for the hairstylists and makeup artists for things like blow dryers and curling irons, and courtesy power for the models for phones and such. While we try to make sure that each station has at least two dedicated 20 amp circuits, invariably someone will come in and plug their equipment into the same power strip as the workstation next to them and it will trip a breaker. Now, runway shows are absolute chaos backstage. Models, hairdressers, makeup artists, production assistants, press, designers, it gets pretty crowded backstage. Security is understandably tight during this whole process, but guards don't actually come in until the day of the show. Because we're already in the space long before the show actually starts, I always try to introduce myself to the security guards so they know who I am. Usually wearing a radio and a tool belt is enough for most people to clue in who we are, and if that fails, the all access pass or wristband seals in, but I always like to take the extra step and be prepared. So one fine show day, I get a frantic call on my radio from the lead production assistant. Vistafiz, there's no power at the hair and makeup stations. Now, if it's actually just one station that's out, or all of them, it doesn't really make a difference. Even having one station out can be an emergency, so I start making my way over. On my way, I encounter lead production assistant who looks very relieved to see me and motions for me to follow. Backstage is packed to the gills, so she makes it to the dressing room entrance a little bit before I do. As I'm about to go in, I get stopped by security. Unfortunately, it's not the same guy that was at the dressing rooms before the show when I was introducing myself, so this guy doesn't know me. Security. Models only backstage. Me. It's okay, I'm on the tech team. I show him my white wristband. Security. Nice try. Gold wristbands only backstage. He grabs my arm and starts pulling me away from the dressing room entrance. You need to go. 
Just then, I get another call on my radio. Lead production assistant. Thistle Fizz, where are you? I key my mic and respond. I'm being escorted out by security at the moment. Something has now finally clicked in Meat Lug's head. Unfortunately for him, he was too slow to respond. Lead production assistant comes storming out of the dressing room. Security, what the heck are you doing? He works here. He's my electrician. Let him go. Security, but he doesn't have a gold wristband. Gold is for dressing room only. White is for all access. Now let go of him. He let go of me, apologized, and I went about my business. I don't disparage the man for trying to do his job, but he probably should have been paying more attention when his boss was going over wristband colors for the day. Entitled Kid Fakes Injury for Three Months to Get Attention Okay, so when I was in the fourth grade, Entitled Kid harassed me. She would never get out of my face, always put me down, and whenever I told her, I don't like you, or please leave me alone, she would say, your friend told you to say that and start yelling at me to not listen to her and that she was a fake friend. Fast forward to the fifth grade. In elementary school, we only got one class with the same classmates for a year and she wasn't in it. I was happy until around a week after the first day of school, she came in with a knee brace that you could find at Walmart for $18 and crutches because she broke her knee. At first, it was believable. She jumped onto a ball and broke it. She came to school every day and got helped by everyone. One time, she made me drop my tray at lunch to carry hers. Every day, she got 11 to 13 kids to go in the elevator with her because she was scared when she had shown no sign of claustrophobia whatsoever. Around a month later, she told me in the elevator to, one, grow out my hair because I had a pixie cut because I looked like a boy, and two, that she only fractured her knee. I googled how long it took for a knee fracture to heal and it said four to six weeks. That's less than a month. I told best friend that, and soon, everyone got fishy. My elementary school had a top floor with half of the school in it, and the bottom floor had the other half, and it was a small school, so info spread fast. Two months later is when nobody believed her. There were rumors that they saw her walking fine without her crutches after she looked around for a second, and others said that they saw her trying to damage her leg in the bathroom. It grew crazy. She started not letting me hang around my friends at recess, because I got to see them all the time and she also made me play wrecking ball on the swing with her. The game was that I was the wrecking ball and had to destroy the leg with the brace on it. I was hesitant at first when I thought she's faking it, so I did. She didn't get affected at all. Three months later was when a skiing field trip was announced. It was happening early in January and everyone was hyped. We all basically ignored the fact that Entitled Kid was still in the brace. She barely got any attention now, and it was probably getting boring using crutches at school for three months, so she just didn't one day, and the next one she was using them again. It was strange, but we all just talked about how she was faking it behind her back. It reached a day before winter break, and she was still in the brace and using the crutches, and was going painfully slow and purposefully dropping everything to get attention, and she did. Everyone would just roll their eyes when she did that. A day after the break ended was the skiing trip, and surprise, surprise, Entitled Kid was out of her brace and not using crutches. It annoyed me so much, but I just ignored it. Around three weeks after the trip, Entitled Mom arrived. It was recess, and I was climbing on this rope jungle gym thing when Entitled Mom started yelling the name of a kid climbing next to me. He was one of Entitled Kid's crushes. She had 20. He obeyed the orders, and he came down. Once he did, she started screaming at him for not loving Entitled Kid for busting her knee, and after that, she went to another one and did the same thing. That school was crap, and all the teachers hated their jobs, so they did absolutely nothing. She's still an Entitled Kid to this day, and I have many other stories to tell about her and other Entitled Kids from that school if you want. Karen yells at restaurant employees because she can't eat here with her family, then tries to kick me out. I witnessed my second wild Karen encounter today. So today, my friends and I decided to go eat ramen at a restaurant in the city. Just me, my friend, and another friend. Restaurants close down seats because of what's been going on, so there are less seats available. Now, this ramen restaurant is not very big, so there are only a few seats available. So here's the cast. We've got Entitled Mom. We've got me. We've got my friend. We've got the waiter and the manager. So we're just minding our own business when this group of six walks into the restaurant. There are only a few seats available, so waiter informs them that they have to wait for the tables to clear up before they can be seated because seats are closed off for everyone's safety. Entitled Mom 
Um, what do you mean I have to wait? Waiter, because of what's going on, we're only leaving a certain amount of seating open. Oh, okay. Why don't you seat us there? She says, pointing to a table with a sign clearly stating closed. Waiter, as I said, they're closed because, oh, it's fine. Just seat us there. We're not sick. Waiter, I'm sorry. I can't do that. That's, I'm sorry. I'm not asking you to seat us there. I'm telling you to. So please do so now. Waiter, if you wait 20, come on. My angels are starving. She says this as she points to her family, consisting of toddlers whining about having to eat ramen. Waiter, we can seat some of you over at the bar if you guys don't need to eat as a group. Without even thanking him, she marches her family over to the bar and rips off the signs to make space for her kids. Waiter, I'm sorry, I can't have you do that. Entitled mom, I can do whatever I want. I am the customer. Waiter, I'm sorry, but if you can't respect our rules, you must leave. Let me talk to your manager. The waiter scoffs and goes to get the manager, who is one of the chefs. Manager, what seems to be the problem? Your rude waiter refused to let me sit at a table, so I had to sit here. Manager, I'm sorry, but you can't sit here. There are signs stating that these seats your kids are sitting on are closed. I don't care. I want to eat with my family. They are starving. Manager, I understand, but if you can't respect these rules, I'm going to have to call the police. No! I am a loyal customer and have been for a month, and I deserve better service. Manager, if you wait, we can seat you over there. He gestures to our table. Okay, how long is the wait? 20 minutes. Entitled mom gasps, then walks over to us. You guys gotta go. Me, what? You heard me, leave. You and your friends need to leave because you guys have been here too long. Me, um, we're not done yet. Don't talk back to your elders. Manager, if you don't leave now, I'm gonna call the police for harassing my customers. Realizing now that she can get in really big trouble, she and her entitled family leave. I ended up getting a meal on the house, but still, some people can be entitled during what's going on. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. Edit. Since many have asked, I think the Karen was mainland Chinese that speaks Cantonese. I can tell by her accent. The dad was an expat, so I don't know. The dad had no idea what they were saying and just nodded. This entire conversation was translated into English, so I did my best, but it's not perfect. Sometimes I had a hard time understanding her because of her heavy mainland Chinese accent. Speaking of ramen, what's your favorite flavor of ramen? Please let me know. How an old rain jacket became my defense against an entitled mom. This happened about two months ago. To give some more preface, a long time ago, I got an old hand-me-down jacket from my uncle who happened to work in the prison system. This jacket happened to have a DOJ, Federal Bureau of Prisons logo on it. I've worn it many times and it's always garnered some interesting reactions from people. I just so happened to be wearing this jacket for our encounter with the entitled mom. Now onto the story. Me and my fiance went out to grab a bite to eat on a Saturday evening. As we ordered and sat at our table, we decided to play with our Nintendo Switch, which apparently is entitled mom bait, while we waited for our food. After a few minutes, I had to go and use the bathroom. A few minutes after I left, according to my fiance, some lady, the entitled mom of the story, came up to our table and had her kid, the entitled kid, sit down in my chair, which prompted this exchange. Excuse me, did you mind watching my kid? There's no kid's play area here, and I saw that you had a Switch for him to play. Entitled kid. What games do you have on your Switch? Do you have Fortnite? Entitled mom starts walking away. Have fun! Fiance, putting the Switch inside her bag. Um, ma'am? I'm sorry, but I didn't agree to watch your kid. He's your responsibility. Also, I don't trust people I don't know with my Switch. Entitled kid. But my mom said I can play with your Switch. Entitled mom to my fiance. Hey now, don't be like that. It's hard being a single mom. Plus, you obviously have the means to entertain my kid. So why not help me out? Fiance. Like I said, I'm not responsible for your kid. I didn't even invite him to sit here. Please leave. Entitled mom. Now you listen to me. I know the owner here, and I will have you thrown out if you don't watch my kid. 
As the entitled mom is yelling this, I happen to be walking out of the bathroom towards the table where my fiance was. As I'm walking up, the entitled mom sees me coming and notices the DOJ logo on my jacket. A smirk crossed her face as I got to the table. Entitled mom tells me, Now, you look like someone in law enforcement. This rude lady here is refusing to give my little angel her switch to play with after she promised to do so. Me, cutting her off and with a stern voice. Is there a reason you're harassing my fiancé and trying to take the switch I bought for her? I watched as the entitled mom's smirk gave way to a look that said, Oh crap. She quickly grabbed her kid and made a beeline to her table. The entitled mom didn't bother us afterwards outside of a few stolen glances. We got our food, ate it, and left after finishing our meal. I was glad I picked that day to wear my uncle's old raincoat. I froze my psycho neighbor out of her apartment. In college, my two friends and I decided to find a place together off campus. We found a beautiful three-bedroom house with surprisingly affordable rent. The basement of the house was listed as a separate apartment, but as it had a separate entrance and the indoor stairwell had been blocked off, we weren't worried, and the thermostat was upstairs. Then the neighbor moved in. From upstairs, we could hear everything. This adult woman would call her mother and scream at her to pay for her cell phone bills and give her grocery money, aka Taco Bell. She would scream at whatever guy she was dating, and one day, she brought home three puppies to scream at too. We were terrified of this woman, and the noise was heck. Also, we had been idiotic enough to sign a lease stating we were responsible for all utilities, period, meaning we were now financing her gas, water, and electric. But with only two months left on the lease, we thought we could just ride it out. But then she started smoking, constantly. According to the landlord, she had quit for good when she signed the lease, but for good only lasted two days. Since it was winter, the heat was running nearly 24-7 and the smoke was wafting up from the vents. Our apartment and all our belongings began to reek with smoke. We contacted the landlord because we had signed for a non-smoking apartment. He told us we lived in a state where you could technically call an apartment non-smoking even if it shared ventilation with a smoking apartment. Forget you leasing laws. At this point, my two roommates were heading out for a two-week vacation. They were online students while I was residential, leaving me alone in the apartment with the jerk smoker in the basement. I couldn't sleep or eat because my idiotic stomach decided to react to all the secondhand smoke by aching and cramping constantly. After three days, I was a little insane. I made a plan. I checked the forecast, lows in the 20s all week. I borrowed a friend's ultra insulated sleeping bag. I bought one of those ski masks with the holes for your eyes and mouth. I got out my stocking cap, my woolen socks, and my down parka. I bought tea, hot cocoa, and ramen, and prepared to live off a diet of hot liquids. And I turned off the heat. Day 1. She's screaming at her mother for forcing her to move into this frozen apartment. Day 2. She's screaming at her boyfriend because he won't let her move in with him. Day 3. She's screaming at the landlord about how she's freezing. Day 4. The landlord is at my door. I greet him in full ski mask, parka, stocking cap array, looking like I'm heading out to rob Santa Claus at the North Pole. He asks me if I don't find it a little chilly in the house. I reply, I had found all the cigarette smoke a little warm. Day 5, she's screaming about the jerks upstairs to anyone who will listen, and I'm sitting upstairs clutching my car keys and my pepper spray with 911 typed into my phone. She finally decides she's leaving and moving in with Greg even though he just got out of prison and he lives in that creepy house in the woods with all those biting dogs. Day six, she's gone. I silently bless Greg. Moral of the story, there's a reason the rent seems too good to be true. P.S. For those wondering, I did have a friend who worked plumbing stop by to give me some advice about how low I could go before I burst the water pipes to heck and back. Actually, Ken, I don't work here anymore, or for you. A friend of mine recently reminded me of this, the absolute best time I ever had dealing with a Karen in the world. It happened about 30 years ago, so I'm going strictly by memory here. I also have no clue what the name for a male Karen is, so I'll call him Ken. I used to work for a chain convenience store, and back in the late 80s, it ran into financial trouble. Corporate decided that, to cut costs, they would sell off slash shut down all locations that didn't have a gas station attached. This included my location. Once the stores were sold slash closed, our positions would be eliminated and we'd be out of a job. 
Although I was only the assistant manager for our location, I was effectively running things as corporate had decided to pull my manager off to a different location and the assistant would be good enough since the store was closing anyway. Now onto the story. Cast. We've got head honcho guy from corporate in charge of selling the store, slightly involved near the end. We've got Ken, the entitled dude who bought our location, and we've got me. Once Chain announced they were going to be closing the doors, it was no secret that we would be shutting down. Of course, us employees were still expected to give good customer service. That was usually no problem as we were in a good area and we had pretty decent customers. They liked us, we liked them. But at the same time, we had no flips to give for the occasional Karens. It was nice being able to shut them down. What were they gonna do, fire us? Good times. I wish I could remember specific instances, but 30 years, they all kinda run together now. The most entitled of all though, was Ken. Turns out, he had bought our location from Chain and would be taking over in about a month and a half. During that time, I was working with head honchos guys from corporate, doing things at the store level for the sale. Meanwhile, Ken came in a few times a week, demanding that certain things be done, as if he already owned the place. He wanted us to change displays, order specific products, etc. Head honcho guys had already told me to ignore his demands, so all of them were met with some variation of, no Ken, I work for the chain, not for you, and this isn't your store yet, which sent Ken off in all his huffing glory, yelling that I wouldn't be acting like that once he ran the place. Fast forward to the final day. All the other employees had worked their last shifts and as acting manager, I opened the store that morning. Head honcho guys arrived to go through whatever they needed and shortly before noon, Ken showed up. Ken and head honcho's guys went into the back and once they came back out, we closed the store in order to finalize everything. Head honcho guys and I cashed out the register for the last time and most importantly, I turned over my key to the store. Once that was done, something close to the following happened. Head honcho. Okay, Ken, we're done. It's all yours now. They start packing up to leave. Me. Just making sure. Chain no longer owns this location. Ken is in charge now. Yes? Head honcho confirms. So I step out from behind the counter. Of course, Ken starts yelling. I think yelling was his default mode. Ken. Where do you think you're going? Me. Home. What does it look like? Ken. You get back here and get your butt back behind that counter where it belongs. Me, calmly. No, I don't work for you. Ken. What do you mean, no? I told you things would be different when I took over, and now you have to do what I tell you to do. Me, with a huge grin on my face. You just don't get it, do you? Ken looks confused. You bought the store. You bought the inventory. But you did not buy the employees, and you sure as heck didn't buy me. So I'll say it one last time and try to get this through to whatever functional cells may be floating around in your empty head. I don't work for you. Never have, never will. And since chain store number 1234 no longer exists, I don't work there anymore either. Since I'm no longer needed here, nod to head honcho guys, I'm leaving. Ken starts sputtering and yelling incoherently, realizing he now has nobody to work the register as I walk to the doors for my last time. Of course, I can't help myself. As I'm pushing the door open, I turn around, give Ken my best customer service smile, and a cheery, have a nice day. If I remember correctly, the store didn't open again for a couple of days, at least, while Ken tried to hire some employees, but anyone from the neighborhood who had seen him treating us so badly before the sale wanted nothing to do with him. And even once it reopened, it didn't last long. That's great, Mrs. Can I have my fish cakes back now? I live in a city center, near a Marks and Spencer, for those unaware of what that is, it's a fairly middle-class department store known for supplying overpriced clothing for middle-aged ladies, pretty but not very functional homewares and posh foodstuffs. I don't shop there very often, but their food is quite good, so I sometimes swing by on my way home from work or on a weekend to treat myself to something tasty. If you hit the sweet spot, you can catch them when their yellow stickering produce goes out of date that day. I like doing this because their ready meals are quite good and freezable, so I can stock up quite cheaply and fill the freezer to discourage myself from ordering takeout. This particular incident took place on a Sunday afternoon, which is always a good time for yellow stickers because the store will have been quieter through the day. However, 
The payoff on this is that it's a haven for old, middle-aged ladies. The Twin Set and Pearl Brigade. They might think themselves posh, but their elbows are razor sharp, so there's a certain amount of risk involved going up against them for the crash and dent stuff. So I'm cruising around the store, perusing their wares. In m and they don't put the stickered produce in one place. It's also spread around the shelves as normal. So I usually hit the reduced section first and then go for a wonder. There was rich pickings, salad vegetables, which I picked up for lunch stuff through the week for work. And then off I went in search of better things. A few ready meals, some meat, a sandwich, and some haddock fish cakes. Remember the fish cakes. The fish cakes are important. So I'm standing by a chiller, minding my own business when I become aware of someone next to me. No biggie, it's a shop. People stand too close. I'm vaguely aware of an older, well-dressed lady at my elbow, but I don't pay much attention. She nudges the hand basket over my arm, so I step slightly away from her and carry on looking in the chiller. A few seconds later, there's another nudge, and then another. Getting annoyed now, I finally turn around and look at her. She's standing there with my fish cakes in her hand. Already in her basket is a bag of salad and some tomatoes, which she's taken from mine. She looks me right in the eye and slowly carries on taking the fish cakes from my basket and places them into hers. My face now must be a dictionary definition of what the heck. Me. Excuse me, what do you think you're doing? Morog. She looked like Morog. I'm sorry, are these things not for sale? Me. They were for sale. They're now in my basket. I start trying to reclaim my purchases and manage to get the salad before she steps back. Yes, but if they're in your basket, they must be for sale, surely. Me. I am buying them. Give them back, please. She's suddenly feigning, being a confused old dear. Oh, but I assume that if you work here, you were just putting them round the store for people to buy. At this point, I give her the Paddington stare. I'm wearing a Glasgow Warriors rugby shirt, blue denims and trainers. I have no makeup on and my hair is stuck to the top of my head. She could not possibly think I worked here unless she had just stepped off the latest shuttle from Mars. Me. Do I look like I work here? Well, it's hard to tell. Shop workers all look the same. Do you work in another shop? That must be it. Me, reaching for my tomatoes. No, I don't. I am shopping. I do not work here. I am buying these things. Now, if you don't mind, I point at the fish cakes. She looks at me blankly. Me. Mrs. Can I have my fish cakes back, please? Oh, yes. Oh, of course. It's a shame. They're my husband's favorites. He loves them. Me, taking them back. Yes, well, I like them too. There's plenty around the corner, full price if you want some. At this point, I walk away while she continues after me, mumbling about being a poor pensioner, but I just ignore her. I spend the rest of my time shopping with my basket in front of my body, and the final kicker? As I go to pay, she's at the dine-in for 12 pounds chiller, engaged in a slightly more agitated conversation with another shopper and an actual staff member. Apparently, she tried to pull the same stunt with someone else who was less polite than I was. I left them arguing over the last beef wellington with red wine sauce. Got kicked out of Walmart for defending a cashier. The year was 2014 in Calgary, Alberta at the beginning of November. The first major snowstorm had blown in and deposited a good amount of snow. Our company truck had blown a tire and for insurance purposes, everyone in the truck, myself included, were not allowed to change it. So we took it to our wonderful Wally World to get the tire changed. We waited patiently in the waiting area so we could get to work. During this time, an irate customer, who shall be henceforth known as irate customer, was tearing into the poor associate working behind the counter. Side note, I had done this exact job when I was in university, so this didn't help. The conversation goes as follows. Customer. What do you mean you don't have my tires? Associate. I'm sorry, sir. We don't have any more in stock. The bays are filled and our stock is gone. This is BS. I wanted those tires. How could you sell all of them? I'm sorry, sir, but we can't sell you something we don't have. We will be restocked in a couple of days. Customer goes on an unholy rant on this poor associate for a good five minutes. During this time, I am just seething for how rude this guy is being and hoping he will calm down. Customer continues to look back at the door looking for support and then continues to berate this poor person. Now, I am a very soft-spoken individual. I do not start confrontation unless required, and at this point, I had had enough. I stood up and looked at the guy and said, Dude, 
It's the first snowstorm of the year in Canada. Why would you think there would be any tires left? let alone you being able to get it right away and get them put on. Customer shot daggers at me and said, Do you work here? Are you his manager? No. Shut up. This doesn't concern you. My coworker, who is 115 pounds of East Coast fire, gets right up into his face and says, How can you be such a jerk to someone just trying to do their job? Is your life so bad that you need to boss other people around to make you feel better about yourself? Now, I've never seen a mob mentality before. But it's amazing what happens when someone will call someone out on their BS and how quickly a crowd will jump to defend someone. They just need permission to act. Well, after two to three minutes of screaming and shouting with this guy, the store manager was called to deal with the issue. The associate was questioned by the supervisor and other customers were filling them on the details. I was within earshot of the store manager and customer and heard this little gem. Customer, all the people are hating me because I'm not white. They're all a bunch of jerks and liars. Store manager, don't you dare play that card with me. If I look through these security tapes, will I see a bunch of people ganging up on you because of what you look like? After all this was said and done, the man was removed from the store. The store manager came up to my coworkers and I and said, I appreciate that you guys stuck up for my associates, but because you instigated and elevated the issue, I'm going to ask you to leave. But I have a colleague down the street who operates a body shop. Take your truck there and he can get you in and out in about 30 minutes. So that is the tale on the best way and reason I have ever been kicked out of a store. I also hope it shows that if you see someone being rude to a customer, stand up for those people. They make minimum wage and should not have to suffer jerks who need a power trip. Girlfriend's entitled father ruins her birthday because everything wasn't his way. So my girlfriend had a doctor's appointment that we, my grandma and I, took her to and it fell on her birthday. So as we get there, we found out we went to the wrong doctor's office, so we had to turn around and go 20 minutes through traffic. We get there, and soon we left the office. I surprised her by getting her Burger King, her favorite food. We get back to her house about 5-6 to six minutes late. When we get into her house and I help her with my daughter, we were instantly being bombarded and screamed at by entitled father. Why are you 5 minutes late? I try to explain to him why we were late, due to traffic and other means. Entitled father, still screaming, says, I don't want to hear your excuses, boy. Why are you late? My girlfriend is very upset about her being yelled at. She starts crying and goes to her room. My grandma tried to explain that it was beyond our control to why we are late. He straight up tells her that she is lying and tells girlfriend that I can't be there for her birthday. And she starts to cry more and plead to him that he needs to stop. Frustrated, I storm out of the house and go sit in the car. About five minutes later, she calls me and said that I can stay. We sit at the table and they bring out the cake, sing happy birthday and start serving cake. Girlfriend is still very upset and still crying. Politely, she declined the cake and got up and left the room for the rest of the night. Her stepmom leaves the room upset and entitled father follows after her. 20 minutes later, entitled father comes out, tells me he is taking me home and we leave. On the way home, he asked me why girlfriend wasn't happy about the cake and that it made stepmom very upset and that she went out of her way to get it, that she was crying about it. I sit there very baffled about what I heard, look at him and just say, do you understand that you screamed at her on her birthday? Her day? The day she should be respected? Of course she is going to cry and not want cake. He starts to, but she made her cry. But I cut him off and say, you ruined your daughter's birthday and you made her cry which made stepmom cry, so it's your fault. I put on my headphones and played music for the remainder of the car drive. One month later, he kicked her out. If y'all want more, there's more. No, Karen, your kid cannot have my asthma medication. Cast, we've got me, we've got Karen, and hero bus driver. I am a 34-year-old Dutch guy without a driver's license. It sucks, but Dutch public transport kinda rocks. So for almost two years now, I've been using it to get to my job, and in those two years, I have never really had a bad experience that doesn't involve a late bus and rain. Until today, that is. Because of what's going on, bus schedules have been adjusted to once or twice per hour. It is far from ideal, but I understand why. Kids are not going to school, so the bus company would lose money letting empty buses drive. But when it came to the schedule, I drew the short straw. Because if I want to go by bus from home to my work, I would be traveling 90 minutes instead of 40, 
and I would arrive at work 30 minutes earlier than normal. To me, this is not an option, so I decided to cycle to work halfway. That way, I cut 30 minutes out of the trip and I get to work at my normal time. The one problem today is that I am asthmatic and it was quite windy out this morning. So I get to the bus station this morning already struggling to breathe. I quickly lock my bike and walk towards the terminal, focusing on my breathing. Five minutes later, the bus arrives. I greet the driver and sit down. A minute later, our Karen of the story enters the bus. She takes a seat on the row next to mine, and a few minutes later, the bus driver starts the bus and off we go. I still feel like I'm struggling for breath, and while coughing, I quickly get my inhaler and chamber out, assemble it, and start using it as I struggle to breathe. It instantly works, and I feel precious oxygen enter my lungs. This piques Karen's attention. What are you doing? She asks. Taking my medication. I have asthma, and with this weather, it was quite a struggle getting here. I replied, does it help with breathing? She asks, and I nod my head. Well, yes, she extended the E. I have kids at home, and if they get sick, I want them to be able to breathe. So give me that inhaler. You can get a new one. And she holds out her hand. Oh boy. Not going to happen, lady. I said in my most dry and mocking tone. I need these meds. I don't care. Give it here. She says as she thrusts out her hand again. My kids need it more. I tell her no and put my medication in my backpack and try to put on my headset. This is where Karen goes full entitled parent and grabs my backpack and starts going through it. Luckily, the hero bus driver was paying attention and we all lurch forward as he hits the brakes. He stops the bus, stands up, and in his best drill instructor voice says, Lady, give the man his backpack back now. There was absolutely no doubt of the authority in his voice and the lady turns tomato red as she hands back the backpack. I thought that was it. Oh boy, I was wrong. I'm not going to type this in caps, but our hero yelled every word. Why on earth would you think that someone's asthma medication would help against the sickness? You are gross, lady. Get off the bus. Now. The lady looks like a deer in the headlights, but doesn't move. Get off now, he yells again. Finally, the lady got up and out of the bus. I thanked our hero bus driver as he sits back down and we get on our way again. As the bus drives off, I saw the lady on her phone. No assault, police, destruction of property, so it could have been much worse. Still, I wish I could tell this to Karen. Too bad we weren't out of the city yet, you disgusting jerk. Crazy Entitled Mother Tries to Justify Stolen Gifts This happened about six months ago when I was home from college. One of my favorite things to do in the city I live in is to visit the aquarium, where I can spend all day. The jellyfish are my favorites, but that's besides the point. At the end of my trip, I text our group chat and ask if anyone's wanting anything from the gift shop, which they did. My total was around $80, which I didn't mind spending on gifts. I put them all into the bag I brought with me that day and set off for the train station to get back home. Before I got to my line, I decided I'd stop in this little mall type area in the city, which led to a train station, so it wasn't too far out of the way. I meander for a bit, looking at the shops and restaurants, before eventually settling for a blizzard. It was that one with lots of chocolate fudge bits in it, I can't remember the name, and set my stuff down besides me. I like to listen to music and watch videos while I sit and eat, so I had my headphones on and the volume pretty loud. So as I'm eating my delicious treat, some little brat comes walking past and grabs my bag from the ground. I was in a tall seat and the bag was on the ground with my back to it, so I'll admit that much was my fault. But here is where it gets interesting. So I finish eating and go to grab my stuff, realizing it's gone. So I check every place I stopped, the bathroom, different shops, and all the food spots I visited, even if it was to just look at a menu. No sign of my bag. So I start to panic. What am I going to tell my friends? I don't want to disappoint them after promising treasures from the big city. Just as I was about to give up, I spot it, next to the aforementioned Brad, eating with his family. So I go over to them and the interaction goes like this. Me. Excuse me, but that bag down there is mine. Thanks for finding it. Mom. Excuse me, that is my son's bag. Leave it alone and stop trying to take it. Kid. Yeah, back off, jerk. It's mine. Already some bad parenting has shown itself. I don't mind cussing, but this kid was like 12 or 13 and shouldn't be insulting strangers. Me. 
Well, no, that's my bag, and I know it is. It's got all my stuff in it. Mom, I'm going to tell you one more time to leave us alone and stop harassing my son, or I'll call the police. Great, it's going to be like this, I thought to myself. Me, to the mom. You don't have to do that, ma'am. I'll take care of that, and wave over a cop who had been watching the ordeal. Probably in case it got violent for some reason. I'm a rather larger guy with an angry resting face, so I understand. I should mention that her husband stayed quiet the whole time, probably not wanting a part in his wife's mess. Cop, what seems to be the issue here? Before I could explain, the mom pipes up. Hi, yes, this man is threatening us because he thinks my son's bag is his, but I'm pretty sure he's just trying to steal it. Kinda strange that I'd be the one to call over the cop, but whatever, lady. Cop to me. Is that true? He said with a bit of a sigh. This probably wasn't his first encounter like this. Me. No, it's actually the opposite. This kid stole my bag, and now his mom is trying to defend him. I doubt he even knows what's in the bag. I was about to ask them to tell me, but now that you're here, officer, maybe you can act as a mediator. Cop. All right, sure. So I hand him the bag and ask him to look around in it. After he does that, I ask the kid to go first. He doesn't get a single thing right other than my charger. Cop. Huh, interesting. Sir, I guess it's your turn. I smile, then I list off all the items I bought along with their price. The receipt was still in there, and I had just bought them, so I was able to remember them accurately. Cop. Well, sir, it looks like you were right. If you don't mind, I'd like to chat with these folks. By now, I could see beads of sweat on the kid's head, and the mother was getting furious. Then I turned to the kid. Me. Maybe don't steal other people's stuff next time, jerk. The mother was red in the face from anger, and the kid was on the verge of tears, because now he had a cop getting ready to lecture him, and his parents will probably ground him until he's 40. But I don't give a darn. He stole my stuff. Anyways, that's my story. Wish people did something to correct their little klepto's behavior rather than try to defend them, because not everyone will take crap from an angry mom. Never assume what languages a person can or cannot speak. So this is an old story for me. Happened back in 08 when I was a stock person at a big box all-purpose store, including a grocery section. I had a working knowledge of where pretty much everything was in the store because I was all over the place, but the grocery department had its own stock team specifically, so I wasn't as knowledgeable there. Now, two things to note here. I am of Lebanese descent, and I was working in South Florida at the time. For those that don't know, South Florida has a significant Cuban population, but not so much Middle Eastern folks. I got confused for Cuban all the time because I had darker skin tone, similar to a lot of Cuban folks. I also speak fluent English, Arabic, and French, but I was born and raised in the Midwest, so my accent gives no indication that I might be of Middle Eastern heritage. On this fine afternoon, I was wheeling back an empty tub back to the stock room after having emptied out one department over. Walking through the main aisle next to grocery, I hear an, excuse me, not rude, but definitely not polite either. I turn to find the Arab equivalent of Ikaren. Let's call her Khadija. Khadija is a 30-something looking woman wearing yoga pants and a tight shirt and a really fancy hijab and jewelry. Because that makes sense, standing with her husband. I grew up in a predominantly Lebanese community in Southeast Michigan, so I definitely know the type. The conversation goes as follows. Me. How can I help you, miss? Khadija. I'm looking for a specific item, but I can't find it. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not as familiar with the grocery section, so I'm not sure where that is. Let me grab one of my colleagues for you. One moment. I could see one of the other customer service guys in the grocery section, so I radioed him to come over and help her out. Me. He'll be with you shortly, miss. Khadija. Thank you, but I'm in a hurry. I thought you worked here and knew your store. Me. I'm sorry, miss. I don't really work in this section. Colleague is coming right down the aisle now. Khadija to her husband in Arabic. They always get these stupid kids to work in these places, but they don't know how to do their job. This jerk doesn't know his head from his butt. The husband gave Khadija a look, probably because he saw my expression turn from my customer service smile to a frown. I had an internal debate about what to do next when her husband spoke. Husband in Arabic. Stop talking. I think he understood what you said. Khadija in Arabic. Of course he didn't. He's an idiot. He doesn't know his hands from his feet. It's an Arabic idiom. Doesn't translate the best. Me in Arabic. Actually, I understood every word you said. I don't appreciate being called fat and stupid. 
An older lady like you should know better than to insult people trying to help you. Worse, you wear your hijab like a hypocrite, pretending to be devout, yet you abuse your perceived social lessers. You should have some respect for yourself. Khadija looked like she had been hit by a truck. Her olive skin turned ghost white and she sputtered at me. You, you speak Arabic? Me in Arabic. Obviously I do. Maybe next time you'll think before you insult people who help you when you think they can't understand. Khadija grabbed her husband's arm and dragged him out of the store, completely mortified. I could hear her husband yelling at her in Arabic that he warned her not to be a jerk all the time, especially when she doesn't know who understands her. I wasn't personally that offended, but I won't deny it was satisfying to scare some sense into her. A very wholesome I don't work here story. After frustratingly trying to get the bolt that plugs the oil drain on my car as well as the oil filter, I decided I should go out to get the supplies I needed to make my job easier changing the oil. After picking up a quick dinner and the tools I needed to loosen everything, I decided I might as well go shopping for what I needed since there was a store right across the street. At first I grabbed my essentials. Amazingly, everything was well in stock at the store and I decided to look through the liquor section to see if they carried my favorite craft beer and see what else they had. While I was looking, a man in his 80s, henceforth known as Man, walked into the area. Man, I can't find the toothpaste. Me, well, this is the liquor section. Man, I know this is. I think it's down aisle 16, but I'm not sure. At this point, I realize he thinks I work at this store. I am wearing a black tee, black jeans, and a stainless steel watch and necklace, and the staff uniform is khakis and a black polo with a store logo on it. I was about to tell the man that I couldn't help him because I was not an employee, but I decided that I wasn't in a rush, and if he didn't realize I was an employee, he might really need the help. Me. How about I help you find what you need? Man. Yes, thank you. I find the aisle where I believe it is, and I grab him a couple of things of toothpaste, show him what is available, and tell him the prices. After he chooses what he wants, we make our way to the cat food aisle. We went through all the cans of cat food that were available, more options than I thought existed. He would pick up a can and ask me to read it. I would tell him what it said, and I would hold which cans he decided he wanted. After about 10 minutes of this, he has everything he needs, and he mentions he had some coffee stored at a cashier and asked me to take him to the lady that was keeping it for him. Me. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't actually work here. I just wanted to help you to make sure you could get what you needed and get out quickly so you weren't around so many people for a long time. After he realizes what happened for the last 10 minutes, we try to find the person who was holding on to his coffee, but he decided to just visit a random cashier. After this, I kept looking through their amazing liquor selections that they had in the store, checked out, and went home to finish working on my car. We did stay six feet apart at most times, unless I was reading a label for him, which would be brief. And I don't always help out whoever thinks I work wherever I shop. It happens often, and I do help out most of the time. But the place was busy, and there were not a lot of workers, so everyone was busy. If someone needs help, you don't have to be their personal shopper, but it's always nice to help someone find what they're looking for. A little kindness goes a long way. Stay healthy, everyone. Family of Karens takes over my restaurant. My grandparents immigrated to Canada from Italy in the 70s and opened up a restaurant. When they passed away, the restaurant went to my parents. Over the decades, they grew and expanded it. I've been working at the restaurant since I was 15. Over time, my parents got older and eventually retired, becoming snowbirds, go to Florida for the winters. They left the restaurant to me about a few years ago, but still retaining a small percent ownership as an additional revenue stream, along with their savings and annuities. Soon as I gained control, I pretty much modernized the old place, remodeled the restaurant, changed the logo, reached out to local and national papers to put out ads, invited food critics, bloggers, vloggers, etc. It was very slow at first, and I began to worry that the loan I took out to do all this was the biggest mistake I had ever done, and I ruined three generations of my family's business, but eventually it began to work, and a local semi-famous YouTuber featured us in one of his videos, and that was the catalyst for more people to come and review, and eventually we were seeing five to ten times the business we usually get, even if it's a Monday. We became a hotspot for major events and it wasn't uncommon for a celebrity to come. On those nights, I even arranged for special high-profile chefs to visit and cook for our guests. Costs of fortune. So during the holidays, we were beyond packed. It got to the point where people would have had to make reservations in July to get a table in December. This process took years to get to where we are now. 
When it gets busy, I don't just sit in the back office. I'm on the floor doing whatever needed to be done. Even if that means I greet people, bussing tables, or even mopping the floors. Other nights, when we have high-profile guests or events, I'm in a blazer and am acting in charge though. On one night, a group of six women walk in. Five of them look like they're still in their early 20s and the head of the group looked like she was in her mid-20s. Best theory, she was one of the other four girls' older sister, or possibly an older sorority sister, to incoming college freshmen, maybe. I was greeting at the door. As they were walking up, Queen Bee Karen was telling the baby Karens on how this place is awesome, food is amazing, and there might even be celebrities here. When she came up to me, she told me she needed a table for six. I replied, of course, can I get the name on the reservation? She looked at me and said, Oh, I didn't make one, but it's okay. The owner is a personal friend of mine. He said he always has one or two tables that he keeps open for special guests and said we can have one of those tonight. Now, generally, this is true of many high-profile restaurants, and lately I've been doing that as well, but I had no clue who this woman was, and she definitely never spoke to me about any of this. I did get she was trying to get in without a reservation, but she literally picked the worst person she could possibly talk to and try this. I told her, I am sorry, but we cannot seat any more without a reservation. As you can see, we do not have any seats available. I didn't want to go all out and say I'm the owner and we have never spoken before, so I never promised you a thing because I didn't want to embarrass her in front of the other girls. At first. She then went on and said out loud to one of the other girls to take a picture of me. She will speak to the owner and make sure I'm either cleaning the toilet or fired by the end of the week. The other girls following her lead were like, Yeah, kiss your minimum wage job goodbye. I'm not sure if they were in on it with her or they honestly thought she knew the owner. Queen Bee Karen then went on and said, Look, you can just give us a table or I can make life very difficult for you. This is not worth losing your job constantly pointing, just trying to put me down, saying things like, obviously you aren't anyone here, because if you were, you would know who I am, and never even try to tell me anything other than yes or of course, constantly trying to belittle me and get that table. At this point, it was a long day for me, and the way I saw it, I had three options. One, tell her I'm the owner and just call her out on all of this. Two, just give her the table and let it be. Three, Teach Queen Bee Karen and her little minions a lesson. I chose option 3 for various reasons, including some personality flaws I am aware that I have, but I like to think it was at least 50% really wanting to teach her a lesson. I smiled at her, said, of course ma'am, follow me please, and I gave her one of the three tables we keep open in case a celebrity comes in. It happens time to time. I told her I apologize for everything, and she is right. It would be simpler to just give her the table. I also told her that the first three rounds of drinks will be complimentary. I set them down and personally served them. As they were sitting down, I told them we do need one of your credit cards and IDs just to keep on file, and we will give it back to you before you leave. Queen Karen gave me her cards and told the baby Karen minions that tonight was on her. I took their orders and got them their free drinks and told them due to how busy we are tonight, there might be a delay on the food. All they were thinking of and cared about were their free rounds. They ordered their three rounds and still no food. They eventually called me and asked me to check on it, the whole time giving me the world's most nasty attitudes since even before they ordered. I told them I will check on it, but also asked if they would like any more drinks. They ordered two more rounds by the time the appetizers arrived. At this point, they're all drunk, having done nothing but drink on an empty stomach most of the night and only having had salads after. As more food arrives, the more drinks are ordered. What these girls never realized was they are at our VIP table, which alone costs a few thousand just to sit in, but I didn't charge them for that. What I did charge them was for all the super expensive drinks they had throughout the whole night, except for the first three rounds. In addition, the table they were sitting in as mentioned was VIP, so the menus were a bit different. For one, they don't say prices on them, trade secret. And in addition, it had certain higher end menu options such as white truffle, black caviar dishes, and specially imported West Coast oysters among other things. At one point in the night, I was honestly rethinking what I was doing and thought I might be going too far with these poor girls. They might not know any better, but some things reassured me throughout all the night. 
such as one of the baby Karens asking me if I felt like my life was worthless since all I ever became was a waiter. Also, one of my other employees told me how they were discussing how to mess with me, to the point that they can just do this whenever they want, and I will know to always give them a table. I also overheard them say, He's cute, but I would never date a waiter like that. He is such a pushover. There were a bunch of comments like that the whole night, so I kept on with their life lesson. By the end of the night, each girl racked up a bill in the range of five to six hundred dollars per person. When I handed Queen Karen the bill of $4,232 with tax and tip included of course, I have never seen anyone sober up so quickly. She went from laughing and giggling with her friends to nearly in tears. She called me over instantly and asked if this was some kind of joke. I took the bill, looked it over and said, Oh yes, I apologize, I will get you the correct bill in a moment. Again, she felt a complete sense of relief thinking she got someone else's bill called me an idiot and went on to talking to her friends. To be fair, I did make a mistake. I did forget to count her eighth order of a dozen oysters that cost about $120 per order. So I gladly just went back and added it to the order. When I went back to give her the correct bill, she flipped out again, going crazy. I just asked if there is something on this bill that she didn't order. She and the girls in shock go over every single line of the bill including the first few lines that show their original three rounds which say complimentary. They then took out their phones and line by line went over everything for the 100th time adding everything up. Extremely rattled, Queen Bee Karen simply said, One second, I need to use the washroom. Part of me thought that she might just pull a dine and dash and leave the baby Karens with the bill, but kind of low key, I did in a way remind her we had her ID and credit card without making it obvious I thought she was going to run out on the bill. 10 minutes later, she comes back with new makeup, obviously she has been crying, and makes up a whole story on how the food was awful, the drinks were bad, and so on, demanding that as bare minimum I should cut the bill in half with the agreement the baby Karens will chip in even though she originally told them the night would be on her. Then, as if a light bulb went off in her head, she again mentioned her relationship with the owner as if it were to give me additional incentive to cut the bill in half. Holding back a grin at this point, I told her, No, just no, I cannot change the bill. She whips out her phone and shows me a series of texts with someone called my restaurant's name owner, which pretty much I realized what she was doing in the bathroom just probably changed one of the other Karen Minion's contact name and deleted previous texts to start this new script. I read them and clicked on contact info and told her that's not the owner's cell number. Her reply was, He has multiple phones for business and stuff. Of course you don't know all his numbers. I thought, wow, this girl thought of everything except I'm the actual owner. I told her, how about this? If we call him and he says that it's okay to take 50% off the bill, then I'll do it. Her reply was yelling and screaming and the whole time customers began to start looking and I knew, okay, it's time to end this. I told her already in a less accommodating voice, cut the crap little girl, you don't know the owner, you have never been here before and if you keep yelling, I will call the police. Her demeanor changed and she was trying to defend herself the best she could. My reply to her weak comeback was, my grandparents founded this restaurant. My family has been running this place for generations. I've worked here almost my entire life. I am the one and only owner of this restaurant and I have never once seen you, heard of you, and I definitely never made a stranger I don't know and have never met before tonight any promises. The mini Karens were just frozen and didn't even know how to react. Queen Bee Karen was in tears. I said, Now I gave you the table you wanted, one of our specially reserved tables for high-end clients, which I didn't charge you for and I gave you three rounds of free drinks. If you don't pay your bill, I will call the cops and hand them your ID. In tears, Queen Karen signed the bill and the mini Karens took out their purses to give her whatever cash they had, which equaled to maybe a couple of hundred, with the promise to pay her back more. Two days later, a man walks into my restaurant fuming and asks one of my bartenders to speak to me. I was in the back office for a bit working, so he waited a good half an hour for me. He was Queen B. Karen's father. She was with him too, keeping her head down. I took them both to my office, showed him highlights of the security cameras, which were especially good quality of audio, because they were in the VIP, which we have to keep good records of, because we have had other unrelated incidents before. So I showed him most of it. 
their comments, their orders, their everything. When all was said and done, he stormed out with her and was screaming at her the whole time they were walking away. Haven't seen or heard from either of them since, but the original bill I gave them, the one that didn't count the $120 oysters, is framed on my desk. Side note, I didn't lose as much overhead on the table in three rounds as you might think. The table was originally supposed to be empty, so I didn't lose anything since I didn't expect to gain anything to begin with, and the overhead for the food and other drinks more than covered the loss on the three free first rounds. Destroy our tree? We'll destroy your driveway. Background. Our house is old. It's really old. Older than the town. Heck, it's older than the Confederation. The house was originally built by a merchant from the area like 200 years ago. It's old. With its age comes a very big property line, and apart from a couple of adjustments here and there to account for infrastructure and housing development, it's basically unchanged from 100 years ago. It rarely ever comes up here, but in any dispute relating to property lines, the official town plan takes precedent, and our property line crosses over into our neighbor's property. This will be important later. And now for the two major players in this tale. Our jerk neighbor, who we will call Lumpy. He's just the worst. He ran an illegal chop shop in his backyard and seemed to be deathly afraid of trees. He also always took a two week long vacation in summer and it was always at the end of July. This part is also important later. The other one is my dad. At the time, he was in government oversight, but before that, he was in the Department of Justice and his major responsibilities included training Crown attorneys. This included the attorneys general. In the order, dad was actually pretty low, but the crown knew and respected him and they were keenly aware that dad knew the law inside and out. If there was anything even remotely resembling a legal dispute, dad was almost always in the right with his argument. Now we begin our tale. The slide. The line between our yard and Lumpy's was pretty clear. Our side was grass, Protestant lilies, shrubs and trees. His was a gravel driveway. Before the incident, there was a large Manitoba maple tree growing there. It was very old, but grew in such a way that it blocked just enough sunlight to have a pleasant level of light coming through the window. We had no intentions of ever removing it, maybe trim it a little if it got too close to the windows. However, some lower branches were sagging onto Lumpy's driveway, so he asked if we could cut down some of the lower branches so that his car wouldn't get damaged when he drove in and out. It was a fair enough request and he did ask permission first, so we told him to get a landscaper and a quote because we sure as heck weren't going to let Lumpy do it and were okay paying for that. A couple days later, we were all on a day trip somewhere and when we got back, Lumpy comes over and tells us not to worry about the landscaper because he took care of it. Red flags were waving at that statement. So we went and checked the tree. This jerk cut the entire tree down. Then to add insult to injury, he painted the stump with some sort of weird gray stuff. Don't know what it was, but it had to have been toxic because nothing ever grew on that stump again, not even fungi. So we're understandably upset, but unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it because there's no proof. So now we've got a stump that was once a beautiful tree, a smug neighbor, and apparently no course of action to take. Dad didn't accept that scenario, and he had a plan. As I said earlier, Dad knew the law inside and out, so he began to plan things out. He made a few phone calls to the town's civil architect, a couple inspectors, the local landscaper Lumpy was going to get that quote from, and a contractor. He visited City Hall and got a copy of the official town plan, which, remember, is the final word on property lines. He had everything arranged, and now he began to wait. Like clockwork, Lumpy went on vacation, and the plan was enacted. Over the course of two weeks, we expanded, we rebuilt our fence to new dimensions, rearranged the shrubs, dug up the gravel driveway and put fresh dirt and grass over it and planted a weeping willow in a spot where, as it grew, would always hang and shed into Lumpy's yard. With the expanded fence and shrubbery, Lumpy's driveway was a small strip of pavement, maybe half a meter wide. The fence placed an old, dying maple and a hawthorn on our side, but because of how the two trees grew, most of it was on Lumpy's side. The key point is that the placement of the trunk dictates whose property it's on. So it's our tree that he can't touch no matter how annoying or destructive it is. With the new dimensions, the chop shop he was running was now on our side of the fence. But because it was illegal, it was just scrap metal as far as the law was concerned. So we sold it to a local scrapyard. By the time Lumpy came back, 
Our yard had expanded almost three meters into his yard, and waiting for him was Dad, the civil architect, and a lawyer with a stack of documents outlining in full detail that what they did was 100% legal and there wasn't a thing he could do about it. Aftermath Lumpy apparently tried to press charges, something along the lines of trespassing or destruction of property or something ridiculous like that. I had moved out of town at the time, so I don't know for sure what happened, but I like to think the judge just threw the case out. Like I said, everything was above board and completely legal. What I do know he did was tear up part of his lawn and put a new driveway. He still had room for it, but it also cut his lawn in half and he had to pay to have sidewalk adjusted into a ramp. Also, because the town was paying attention now, he had to have it done properly, with like asphalt and stuff, instead of gravel like before. He's also apparently planning to move out and rent the property to others. Need a taxi? Not me, guy. I'm a musician. I play in function and cover bands, doing weddings, partings, and so on, in bars, hotels, pretty much anywhere where people ask us. Really, as long as they pay us and we consider, we're likely to survive the experience. As I'm out working late at night and usually in licensed premises, I encounter a lot of drunk, stupid, entitled people along the way. It's par for the course and they're usually not too much of a problem, but there are always exceptions. One evening some nights ago, I was playing in a function room in North London. There were two bands booked that night, plus a DJ. Ours was a late finish. We were the final band on and our set began at midnight and ended at 3 in the morning. We played there quite regularly, so knew the score. The gig itself went fine and everyone enjoyed themselves. We finished our set and packed up our gear while the staff began to shoo the customers out and clear up the venue in preparation for closing. As it was the middle of the night, there were few if any buses or public transport running. Those who had not arrived in their cars had to find a taxi to take them home. There was always a queue of taxis outside the front doors plus a scrum of people trying to get into them as there were never enough cars to go around. There was no queue. It was every man and woman for themselves. The door staff did their best to try and keep order, but it was a bit of a melee. By the time we had packed away and were ready to load our kit into our vehicles, most customers had left, leaving the stragglers who had not managed to find a taxi. I left my equipment by the door just inside the venue and went to fetch my car from the car park across the street. As I play the bass, I had two large speaker cabinets. This was before the days of compact, lightweight bass amplification. Two flight cases containing my instrument and amplifier, another case full of cables and accessories, plus a couple of lights and part of the PA system. I drove a Volvo Estate, about the only vehicle that would accommodate the amount of stuff I had to transport. I parked outside the front door and went in to collect my stuff. I wheeled the first of my speaker cabs out to find three people sitting in my car. I opened the tailgate, lifted the speaker into the vehicle, and asked what they were doing there. You're a taxi, came the reply. Take us to Harlesden. Sorry, I replied. I'm part of the band. I need to load my equipment. Would you get out of the car, please? Don't give us that. You're a taxi. Now take us to... I walked around to the passenger door, looked in, and said, Listen, mate, take a look at my face. Ring any bells. You've been looking at me up on that stage for the last three hours. I'm in the band. Now get out of my car, please. Don't lie, you jerk. You're a... Realizing this was going nowhere. I went to the rear of my car and retrieved the pickaxe handle I kept there for emergencies. I went to the passenger door, opened it, and told my new friends to get out and waved my little friend at them. For the last time, I'm not a taxi. Now get out or you'll get this. This had the desired effect. They got out, grumbling, and went back to the front door to wait for a taxi. I continued to load the car, bid good night to the door staff, got in, and started the engine. As I did so, one of the three ran to the car. I quickly engaged the central locking. He pulled on the door handle. When it wouldn't open, he wrapped his arms over the roof and around the windscreen on the passenger side, shouting, Take us to Harlesden, you jerk! His friends headed towards the car, so I engaged first gear and eased forward. They stopped, but our hero clung on, kicking at the door and yelling. I increased my speed and swerved from side to side in an effort to dislodge him. He clung on, still yelling. He held on until I got to the end of the street but I managed to throw him off by taking the sharp bend at the end of the road at speed. He fell in a heap in the road and lay there. I didn't bother to stop to find out if he was alright. Customer drops milk jug, proceeds to grab another and buys it without giving us a chance to clean the previous mess. So, like I said in my previous post, I'm a closing cashier most days, 
with a few days where I'm in the aisles helping throw freight here and there. Today was another cashier day, and it was right after my day off. The shift was going fine and all, not that many rude customers, a couple of times where I was pulled from the register to help move stuff, the works. Then it happened. Enter Kevin, not his real name. Kevin seemed normal enough, nothing weird about him. He came to me with an arm full of items and asked where the milk was. I pointed into the dairy section and he just kinda left his stuff on my conveyor belt and walked like he didn't have a bunch of items on my belt. I think to myself, okay, a little weird, but whatever, he should be back soon. Five minutes and a couple customers later, he finally comes up with another armful of things, not including the milk. Me. Uh, sir, did you find the milk okay? Kevin. Oh, darn it. I got distracted. Hold on. Another five minutes go by, and he finally gets a jug of milk. The transaction goes like normal. He pays, and he gets ready to leave. Me. Did you want me to grab a cart for you, sir? That seems like a lot of stuff to carry. Kevin. Nah, I got it grabs everything but the milk, which he saved for last. I legit thought to myself, the second before this happens, I sure hope he doesn't drop it. Well boy, let me tell you, he drops it, from his arms to the floor. The jug crashed on both sides, so even if the other cashier I had in front of me was plugging one hole, the other would just be a milky waterfall. We panic and toss it in the trash can and call for a wet cleanup. Now, usually if someone damages an item in store that they already bought, We'll replace it for them. They already paid anyways. However, I was in so much shock from the sheer amount of milk that ended up on the floor on my point of sale station and even going into my coworker's point of sale. So he ended up buying another jug. So he goes to get it while I'm trying to get as much milk up as I possibly can without a mop until a courtesy clerk shows up. And he goes into my line, the one with the dairy flash flood that would make Noah's Ark blush. So now he's got more of a mess since he's leaving boot prints everywhere in the front and he's bought another jug of milk. I didn't care. I just wanted him out of there so I could get this cleaned. It took us about half an hour to get all of the milk out of wherever it all went to. The manager saw all of this and she let me take my last 10 minutes early. The only sort of ending I have to this story is that a couple days later I was in the aisles with new courtesy clerk that helped me clean it all up. Basically just helping set up spots to put the new products in and Kevin's back. He recognized me and immediately apologized. I wasn't mad or anything at him, it was just a whole sequence of events that kinda overwhelmed me at the time. I said it was fine and I was glad to help him out and he went on his way. So basically, I'm gonna have flashbacks whenever I see a gallon of 2% in my fridge. Entitled Mom Treats Me Like an ATM Backstory Allowed a friend of a friend who was down on her luck to room with me for two years, so we did become close friends as she needed to get away from her horrible ex slash father of her son. In hindsight, the fact her boyfriend at the time would not spring for a place for her to move in with him should have been a red flag for me. There's a whole other story regarding both the father and the boyfriends, plural, that I won't get into right now. Fast forward a couple of years, stuff happened, lost my job, had to move back home, literally across the country, got rehired. Still kept in contact with her, and since I could afford it, $100 every couple of months to help her out wasn't hurting my finances while she was down on her luck. She was back living with her mom and on government assistance for a while, so it was infrequent enough that it didn't bother me. But after a while, I was getting tired of her begging me to borrow some cash, realized I never did tally the total amount, and was shocked to find out it was over $12,000 over 8 years. So I basically gave her an ultimatum early last year. Essentially, I'm cutting you off at the end of this year, 2019. You have a year to get your act together. If you do, great. You don't need to rely on me anymore. If you still need help, then I'm just throwing money away into a black hole. I thought I was helping you get back on your feet, not letting you live off of me. Whatever the case, come January 1st, I'm not responding to any requests for money, period. Things were cool the first half of the year, but then the latter half is when things went south. First, it was more frequent requests for money, like helping for the initial deposit of an apartment as her new job didn't pay her yet, or groceries. Okay, critical life stuff I can accept, like she'll need a cell phone plan to handle email and such for job hunting. But then it was like requesting $500 in the span of two weeks and small chunks of $40 here, $80 there. Then one time, instead of asking first, she'd just send a money request from her bank, 
as if I was an ATM and would just blindly send it along. And if I didn't respond right away, she'd spam my phone, even though she knows I'd be busy working, in meetings or commuting. A portion of it is on the subway, so I'd be offline for around 30 minutes, but obviously she can't wait that long. Cue the phrase we've seen in this sub for a lot of entitled parents. Failure to plan on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. Then the parent parts. There were incidents like asking me to pay for her kid's medication because his dad forgot to pack it for his visitation. Why should I be paying for this? Not my kid. Shouldn't you be asking his dad? No, I'm not giving you $80 for a bus ticket for your son to visit you. I know you miss him, but I don't see it as a critical expense. I'm sorry, but maybe you should try deferring the visit till later when you're more financially stable. I'm sure your 12-year-old son will understand. Then the kicker, this past Christmas, she had saved enough money to buy a Nintendo Switch. Not, you know, saved up the money to handle surprise expenses or pay me back, not that I expected, but went immediately towards a very expensive gift for her son. The reason she was contacting me, however, was that her ex-boyfriend, not the one from before, I've lost count of which boyfriend, probably number eight at this time, had serious entitlement, anger, and mental issues, broke into our apartment, stole a bunch of stuff like the switch, and pawned it. Thankfully, the police were able to get him, and I believe he's in jail now. However, she's still out of a present. But instead of getting a cheaper present, or asking around other friends and family to pitch in, she contacts me first and asks for $200 to go towards the present. Obviously, I declined. I think she eventually settled on a gaming keyboard and mouse for him. Naturally, she used the ruin Christmas line on me, which got me really upset. Her ex ruined it, not me. I don't really owe her anything. She's not entitled to my money. I'm not an ATM at her beck and call. So far in 2020, she still tried to borrow money, but I've held true to not giving her anything. Also, never having roommates ever again, especially people with kids. Entitled sister wants to be given a lake house for free. Background. My grandparents owned some nice land on a lakeshore about four hours away and decided to build a little vacation house on it. They would spend every summer there at first, sometimes bringing my two older sisters along, the eldest entitled sister and cool sister. Entitled sister went for the whole summer a few times without cool sister. I didn't go at this point in time because I was too young. It is important to note that while initial ownership of the land and some of the construction costs were paid for by my grandparents, it was really my dad that paid the rest of the bills, taxes, utilities, lawn services, etc., which he saw as fair enough since they helped him start his business and he loved his parents. As time went on and their health was declining, they started going to the lake for much shorter spans of time. I think I went once or twice with them on these shorter trips and would go with my parents on the rare occasion they would go up in fall and a few times for the 4th of July. Those fall trips were almost exclusively to do maintenance with a little fun on the side. Around this point in time, Grandpa passed away. Grandma would be around for a long time after that though. She was always much healthier than he was. When my sisters were old enough to drive and do their own thing, an agreement was made between my dad and Grandma that my sisters could go to the lake house whenever they wanted to on the occasion that every other trip they would bring Grandma with them as she couldn't drive the trip herself. Cool sister held this bargain up for the few times she went. I even got to join them for a couple of those trips. Entitled sister, not so much. I think entitled sister brought grandma to the lake two, maybe three times collectively, with a lot more trips with her husband in between than could possibly equate to every other time. Eventually, she just forgot the whole take grandma with you thing and started just going to the lake all the time. Her forgetting grandma got to the point that when she would come back after her trips to drop the keys off, that she was always too busy to come in and say hi to grandma for a minute. The rest of us saw this as majorly uncool. Grandma herself felt extremely betrayed by Entitled Sister because of that. It's worth noting that when Entitled Sister was little, she was most certainly my grandparents' favorite. They were always buying her things and taking her places and treating her like a princess. That probably explains why Entitled Sister turned out the way she did. At this point in time, the lake house more so belonged to my dad than anyone, even though he barely used it. Partially because he didn't have the time to go, partially because he had too much pain physically to want to make a four-hour trip. One year for Christmas, Entitled Sister bought new sheets and comforters for the beds at the lake house 
and boxed them up and gifted them to my dad. This essentially was a gift to herself though, as at this point in time, she was the almost exclusive user of the house. It was seen for what it was. Everybody chalked up to her usual selfishness, but didn't call her out on it. My dad had strongly debated selling the lake house since only entitled sister was using it. For anyone who knows what just owning a house costs in America, he had good reason for wanting to take those bills off his desk, but he decided against it as my grandma was still around and felt it would break her heart if he sold it, possibly harming her then dwindling health. Entitled sister continued to use the house to her heart's content with rare trips in between from my parents and even rarer trips from cool sister. My parents would bring grandma to the lake the few times they went since entitled sister couldn't be bothered to do so. At this point in time, I was able to drive, but being single and not really having any friends who are outdoorsy, I didn't really see the point in going there alone. So I didn't go other than sometimes with my parents. Maintenance fell to my parents, myself, and cool sister. That was mainly what those rare trips I was involved with revolved around. Entitlement gone wild. Not too long after this, Grandma passed away and left everything to Dad since he was the one keeping everything paid for and fixed. Entitled Sister continued to use the lake house as she had been doing, albeit with even a little more entitlement now that she felt it belonged to her. The rest of the immediate family went and cleaned up the house so it would present nicely for sales photos. Entitled Sister flipped when she found out the house was going on the market, stating, Oh yeah, I guess Dad is going to hawk the house and pocket the money to my mother at one point. This sentiment quickly got back to my dad, and my dad, being kinder than I, could have offered the house to Entitled Sister for free. The plan was to gift it to her a certain amount every year for 10 to 15 years, so she wouldn't be taxed on the exchange of the deed, and that Entitled Sister's family would just take over the bills. She didn't like this because she felt he was just gonna take it away from her at the last second, even though there was no plausible reason he would want to do that especially at his age. She also didn't like the $6,000 a year in property tax, utilities, lawn care, etc., saying that they couldn't afford it even though her family was taking something in the order of ten dollars to $20,000 worth of vacations every year in addition to the numerous lake house trips. It was also offered to become hers instantaneously, which would cost her extra money, but then she wouldn't be afraid of having it taken away. This, of course, was also rejected. So dad put it up for sale as he was tired of paying $6,000 a year for something he didn't use and barely anyone other than Entitled Sister used. Entitled Sister raged about this and her 37 going on 13 way, but that still didn't stop her from going to the lake all the time. She said it would and it did at first, but it didn't stay that way for very long. The lake house set on the market for years with periodic price drops as it was originally listed at an optimistic price by my dad in hopes that he might recover some of the sunk costs from over the years. The offer of, you can just have the lake house, just pay the bills, was floated to Entitled Sister at least two more times during this. I believe she assumed the house would never sell and dad would eventually just give up. Enough time had passed that I found myself in a steady relationship with someone and finally felt I had a reason to go to the lake house since it was still in the family. But it seemed that any desirable date and time I wanted to go, Entitled Sister had already laid claim to it. So even though I was busy all the time, similar to my dad, and had rare opportunities to go, I had to schedule around Entitled Sister, who was able to go to the lake pretty much any time she felt like it. Her schedule was, slash is, immensely flexible because she didn't, slash doesn't work. Her husband makes loads of money and pays for everything for her. Recently though, out of nowhere, some buyers found the lake house and the whole closing process began. Closing day was to be in less than a month. My parents couldn't decide how to delicately give this news to Entitled Sister since they knew crap was going to hit the fan with her. The decision was taken out of their hands when Entitled Sister came to my parents' house and announced she was going to the lake house on XYZ date that was a week after the closing date. They were forced to tell her that it is sold and she started crying and sprinting back to her car. It was as though she was, she was five and just discovered that Santa isn't real. Mind you, at this point, she was 42. A couple days later, her husband came over to have a talk with my dad about the lake house. Entitled sister didn't join her husband in this, just gave him a few talking points. This presumably was because she was incapable of holding back her rage during the meeting. In the conversation, the deal of, you guys can just have the house, 
just take over the bills was offered yet again and rejected yet again for the same BS reason. Through further discussion, it turned out that Entitled Sister and her husband felt my dad had enough money and that my dad was more than able to continue paying the bills on the lake house so it could stay in the family. Red, keep getting used for free by Entitled Sister. My dad, with the apparent patience of a saint, didn't flip out over such an unreasonable expectation, just stated they were at an impasse and it was going to be sold. Entitled Sister's husband then tried to bargain for Entitled Sister to go for one last weekend because Entitled Sister wants to at least say goodbye to Grandma. This is totally laughable, since Entitled Sister couldn't be asked to take a minute out of her busy schedule to even say hi to the sweet old woman when she was alive. I don't think Entitled Sister even gave her a phone call in all those years. My dad didn't point out any of that though, just stated that since the deal was so close, he didn't want to do anything that might upset the buyers. This was met with immense disappointment as now Entitled Sister's husband had to go home and feel her wrath when he delivered the news. The End Result The lake house was sold to a lovely older couple at a pretty sizable loss. Entitled Sister is barely speaking to my parents now. Not a big change from normal really, shocking I know. Despite my parents being far more accommodating than I would have been in their position. At one point in the time since the sale, she mentioned that she had spent over $300 on the bedding for the lake house that she wasn't going to get back since the new people kept the furniture. This is, of course, forgetting the part where she gave the bedding to my dad for Christmas many years before. I don't really know what her endgame was. Did she expect my dad to keep paying the bills until he dies? If so, what then? If she were to inherit the lake house at that time, she would still have to pay the bills. They just can't afford. Plus the exorbitant taxes for transferring something valuable. The most likely scenario I can come up with is that she was assuming because I'm most likely to take over the reins in the coming years that I would take over the bills and let her keep using it, tolerating her crap the same way my borderline saintly parents have. Pretty amusing considering she barely acknowledges slash has acknowledged that I even exist over the years. That used to really bother me, but this whole situation, among other unnecessary confrontations, has made me realize things were slash are better off that way. Karen at the Movie Theater I worked at a small movie theater that usually showed some alternative films. There were several other activities in the building, including choirs and theater groups, but I worked for the cinema and did not keep a track of where and when the other activities were. At the cinema, we had a computer connected to the movie, ticket booking, and the cinema's email. This computer had settings, so we who worked there couldn't be on whatever pages we wanted. Important info. This time, I was working on a Wednesday for the first time and had no idea what was happening in the building, except what film I was going to show. While I was sitting at the computer arranging small things, Karen shows up. Excuse me? Yes, what can I help you with? Do you know where the International Choir has its practice? Unfortunately, no. I only work for the cinema and have no knowledge over other activities. Don't be silly. Look it up on the computer for me. I can't do that. The computer only works with the programs we have for cinema and the booking. So you can see all the bookings in the building? No, I can't. I can only see the cinema bookings. Are you too important to help me or what? Me. Excuse me, but I don't know how I can help you. I don't know where the International Choir has its practice where they start, or who is responsible for them. But I know we will be showing our movie tonight if you're interested. Karen storms off and I remain slightly irritated. Visitors to the evening's movie come and pay for their tickets, enter the salon and sit down. Five minutes before I close the doors, Karen came back. I couldn't find the choir, so I'll take the cinema instead. Me, sorry for not being able to help you sooner, but fun, you wanna see the movie. Then I explain that it is free placement in the salon and what the tickets cost, and that it's to a discount if you're over 65. Do you think I'm old now too? Me, surprised. No, this is information I provide to all customers. You still think you're too important for me, but I buy a ticket anyway. Me, okay, here's the price. Wasn't it cheaper? If you're over 65, it's cheaper. I am over 65. Then you will get the discount. I write in the discount and print out her ticket and give it to her. She snarls and goes back into the salon. Time goes on and afterwards I started the movie. I can start putting away the candy and warm my lunch. 
Then Karen comes out from the salon looking at me. Karen. What? Did you get paid to eat? Me. When the movie is on, I can't do much else. The computer is locked, no more customers will come in, and I'll be here until after the credits are done. So yeah, I'm having my dinner now. <laughs> the computer certainly works. Me. No, I can't prepare tomorrow's movies today because when the last movie of the day is started, the screen locks for security reasons. But can I help you with something because you're not in the salon watching your movie? Karen. I didn't like it, so I'll go now. And I'll tell your boss how unpleasant you have been with me tonight. She goes away and I eat up my dinner. Before I email my boss and tell him what had happened, my boss replies by reminding me that I cannot use the computer after the last movie goes and ask if anything else happened during the evening. Not the best boss, have more stories just about him. I answer no and the rest of the time I spend on YouTube on my private phone. No sir, I cannot valet your car. I don't care if you're friends with the president of the company. Once upon a time, I was a valet for a semi-local hotel chain. My hotel in particular had multiple floors of event space and no on-site garage. Therefore, sometimes we would have 400 people attending an event and we could only park a handful of cars. This night was one of those nights. We had two large events, which had already begun two hours ago. And for some event, people were still showing up. In arrives our entitled man. I'm busy opening a door for someone when he pulls up in our loading zone and stands outside his car talking to someone on the phone. I walk over and he just holds out his hand with his keys and continues with the conversation. Me. Hi, sorry, but we're full for event parking. Him. Ugh, then just leave it where it's at. I'm late. Me. Unfortunately, that's not a spot. I can't certainly direct you to the nearest parking structure. Him. Oh, what's one more car? Just park it. Me. I'm sorry, but we just can't accommodate any more vehicles. It's a car. It'll fit anywhere. Me. I'm sorry, but I really don't have room. He angrily walks back to the car, phone still in hand, then turns back towards me. Does it help that I'm friends with the president of your company? No. Then I'm going to call him and tell him that this hotel can't even valet like they're supposed to. This is unacceptable. Me. Okay. And he huffs his way back to his car and speeds off into the sunset or around the block, but whatever. And I did not run into him the rest of the night, which was nice because I thought for sure he would come back to scream at me. He actually did call the president and told him how we couldn't valet him, in which the president laughed at him and told him to arrive earlier. Why did you seat those people? We were here first. This happened at my first hostessing job years ago, but it still makes my blood boil to this day. It was a usual busy weekend and an elderly couple walks in with no reservation and I told them it's a 15 minute wait. But luckily there's no one in front of them and they were peeved. The restaurant is an open floor plan and you can see the entire dining room from the front door. But I guess they couldn't see that well because obviously they couldn't tell how busy we were. The elderly couple sat in the waiting area and waited while staring me down. Not even a few minutes later, some people came in that are actually meeting a big party that's already half there and seated. They just needed help finding their friends. I showed them where their friends were and when I got back up to the host stand, the old lady threw her hands up in the air and said, What the heck? And the old man went berserk. Why did you seat those people? We were here first. I explained to him that they weren't a new table, that their party already arrived 30 minutes ago and they're just the remaining guests left of that big party. You would think that would be the end of his fit. But since he knew he couldn't be mad at me because I was actually right, he started going off about something else. Well, you better do your job right then and see us right now. This is ridiculous. I replied, don't worry, sir. I know how my job works. I'll seat you when there's actually something available and made them wait an extra 10 minutes on top of their 15 just to be petty. But they literally didn't even notice. I don't know why, but this story still gets me raging. Entitled people ignore me and steal my groceries as I lay unconscious in the middle of the store. I have a heart condition called NCS, which essentially means that the nerve that controls dilation of my arteries can get triggered for no reason, causing my blood pressure to plummet and me to black out. For most people, this either happens with a trigger such as blood or pain, or they have a high enough normal blood pressure that if the nerve does get triggered, they don't drop to a low enough blood pressure to fall unconscious. Long story short, I usually can't walk for long periods of time without passing out 
so I typically order my groceries ahead of time online and pick them up to avoid putting myself in a dangerous situation. However, thanks to people panic buying at the start of this whole thing going on, everyone and their brother were ordering groceries online to avoid contact, and stores were out of everything on top of that. So all online order slots either couldn't be filled or were taken up for two weeks into the future. This meant that I had to walk around the store to find my groceries, which is a lot harder than it sounds for someone who can drop without warning. This day in particular, I ended up having to try six different stores to find what I needed, and by the time I got to the grocery store that had the bulk of the items I needed, I was exhausted and slightly dizzy. But I had to finish my shopping or there would be no food in the house thanks to everyone who was hoarding. Anyway, I get about halfway through the store, my cart piled up including the last of a few items and I feel the familiar feeling of my body giving out under me. I was able to get to the ground and sit safely but I was losing consciousness quickly. At least four people passed me while I sprawled out on the floor covering their faces and rushing away like they thought I was sick or something. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, a kind old lady approached me to ask if I was okay. All I could do was pull my medical alert necklace from inside my jacket before everything faded away. I don't remember much of what happened exactly, but in the spurts that I was awake, I remember an employee with a gallon of water trying to make me drink and then vaguely a paramedic showing up. By the time I came to, the employee asked if they could pull my cart off to the side until I was done in the back of the ambulance. I agreed, knowing that as soon as I had more fluids in me, I'd be back to normal in a matter of minutes. 20 minutes in the back of an ambulance and a full bottle of water later and my blood pressure was back to normal. My sister was on her way to help me get home safely and I was released to go check out my groceries. When I came back into the store, however, my groceries were gone. The same vultures that had passed me while I was helpless and nearly unconscious on the floor had found the cart the employees tucked away for me and picked through it all and taken whatever they wanted. I was upset and too weak to reshop. I left the whole hot mess of a situation empty handed and had to go back again the next day because apparently people are entitled enough to pass up an unconscious person in the middle of the store to resume their panic buying as well as to steal from a cart that was clearly set aside by employees. Entitled mom spent an hour shopping while her kids screamed the entire time then tried to exchange clothes from over a year ago. So this happened a few years ago when I was working part-time at a clothing outlet. Let's just say that this company sells higher-end clothing and caters almost exclusively to Karens. My life was heck for those two years. God bless those who work there full-time. You are the real heroes. Cast, we've got me. We've got Entitled Mom, the lady who has clearly never interacted with another human being. We've got Entitled Kid, her screaming one-year-old. And we've got my poor coworker. Let me start by saying this was a Saturday shift in a crowded shopping mall and I was working a double to cover for a coworker. I had recently been promoted to shift lead so I was the manager on duty that day and was closing. Fast forward to the end of the day. The day was insane and by the end of it both my coworker and I were exhausted. We were tidying up the store and taking care of all the go backs when I heard the door open. It was 8.53, we close at 9. Enter Entitled Mom and Entitled Kid. Typically, if we have customers that come in that late, it's to grab a gift card or something. We do have the occasional shopper that comes right before close and stays a while, but they are typically fairly quick when they realize that they are the only ones there holding us up. Not tonight. The first thing I notice is that Entitled Kid is screaming, like it's really loud. I walk up to greet Entitled Mom over the sounds of her screaming offspring. Me. Good evening, ma'am. Is there something that I can help you find today? Entitled Mom. No thanks. Just browsing. The worst answer. Me. Okay. Well, let me know if you need help with anything before I close the dressing rooms. My little way of insinuating that it's late and I want to go home. Entitled Mom. Well, I'll definitely need a dressing room. Can you go ahead and start one for me? Me. Yelling at this point over the sound of Entitled Kids screaming. Sure thing. Entitled Mom. Sorry about him. He's had a long day. Haven't we all? As I walk away, I notice that Entitled Mom has a trash bag full of clothes underneath the stroller that she's carting around her screaming kid in. Odd, but whatever. Maybe she has a Goodwill donation. For the next hour and a half, this woman tries on every single article of clothing in the store. Per corporate policy, we can't rush guests as they shop as long as they come in before clothes. We tried everything. 
turning off the music, sweeping the floor, closing the two out of three registers, etc. Pretty much all the indicators that we are closed and to get out. And yet, she stayed. And her kid screamed for an hour of it before he fell asleep. At around 10.30, she's ready to check out. I have coworkers start to ring her up so I can get closing started in the back and get us the heck out of here. I'm in the stock room when I hear the screams. I rush out and I find this lady screaming and coworker, who is one of the nicest people I've ever known, is crying at this point. Ni, nee, what seems to be the problem? Anything I can help with? Entitled mom. Yes, you can fire this idiot because she's treating me like absolute garbage. I don't think corporate will be very happy to hear how their employees are treating paying customers. Coworker looks at me with tear-filled eyes. Me. Coworker, will you go to the back and finish the online orders for me? I'll take care of Entitled Mom. Okay, ma'am. What can I help you with? Entitled Mom. Well, I was trying to get these clothes returned so I can put the credit towards my purchase. Entitled Mom then takes the full garbage bag of clothes and dumps it out in front of me. Technically, the clothes inside the bag were all from the store where I worked. However, they were all a year older or more. Clearly well-worn, no tags. Me. Ma'am, I'm so sorry, but you cannot return these. What? Why not? Well, for one, they don't have any tags, you don't have a receipt, and they have clearly been washed and worn by you for quite some time. Returns are typically recent purchases that don't quite fit. Well... These don't fit me anymore, so I would like to return them," said in a very condescending tone. Me. Our return policy is 30 days, and it can't be washed, and you need a tag or receipt. Can't you just give me store credit? No, I cannot. You can try resale shops if you want to, but we aren't a thrift store. These pieces aren't even in production anymore. I'm not an idiot. I know these clothes are from a while ago because I'm the one who bought them. They don't fit me anymore because I was busy creating human life and now I need new clothes. She gestures to her poor exhausted kid who at this point has woken up and began to scream again. Me. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but I still can't accept these as returns. Can I help you purchase the clothes you picked out today? Like heck you can't. I have had a long day and deserve this. I can't afford to buy these without returning my old clothes. Me. Then I don't know what I can do for you. You can get me your manager. Me, full of satisfaction. I'm the manager on the floor tonight. Well then, you are so done for. I'm calling corporate to report you. Me, here's their number. Call center's open tomorrow at 7 a.m. Entitled mom's mouth dropped. Pretty sure she didn't expect me to be so cavalier about getting reported, but I did not give a single hoot at this point. She was quiet for a moment and took a deep breath and asked if I could help her bag up her old clothes to take with her so she could give her screaming kid a snack. I was pretty shocked at the abrupt mood change, but whatever. I'm exhausted and want to leave so bad. I start bagging up her old clothes when she reached down to grab her kid's snack. As I'm putting the clothes in the bag, she reaches over the counter, grabs the clothes she was going to purchase, and then runs towards the door. I just stand there because it's against our policy to stop people from shoplifting anyway, and I've locked the doors to prevent other people from coming in. She gets to the doors and violently yanks the handle back and forth, trying to open them. I calmly walk over. Let me out! Me. Sure thing. I hold out my hands for the clothes. She glares at me, then wisely decides it's not worth it. She shoves the clothes at me and turns away, muttering at me as she does so. I unlock the door and she leaves. As if that encounter wasn't crazy enough, she actually called corporate to complain after literally trying to shoplift from our store. What a wild ride. Entitled jerk almost paralyzes my friend, parents scream at principal and refuse to pay hospital bills. Today I have an amazing story for you. By the way, this story took place in a private school. Cast. We've got me, we've got entitled kid, entitled mother, entitled father, the teacher, and my friend. Background. Entitled Kid is a jerk, there is no doubt about it. He's an arrogant jerk who thinks he can get away with anything, and he pretty much can, since whenever people call him out, he calls his mommy and daddy, who are friends with the principal. We think they bribe him, so he never gets in trouble. All the teachers and students who know him hate him, but since I'm in a private school, what the principal says goes, so no one can do anything about him. Luckily, I changed schools this year as I got accepted into a gifted and sci-tech school, 
So I'm finally done with him. The actual story. Friend and I were in music class with the rest of our class, including Entitled Kid. We are unfortunate enough to have to sit next to Entitled Kid as all three of us play the saxophone. And teacher seats us according to which instrument we play. Since Entitled Kid always sits on the end seat, Friend and I take turns next to Entitled Kid. Today was Friend's turn. Entitled Kid was completely ignoring class and was just spending his time annoying Friend. Entitled Kid would pull back Friend's seat every time Friend tried to sit down. 20 minutes into class and Friend had already caught Entitled Kid doing it 5 times and pulled his seat back into place so he could sit in it. Unfortunately, Friend didn't catch Entitled Kid the 6th time he tried this. Friend had just finished playing his solo and when he sat back down, Entitled Kid pulled his seat back yet again. Friend didn't notice, so he ended up falling backwards. However, Entitled Kid didn't pull his chair back very far, so Friend actually ended up hitting his head against the sharp edge of the chair. Keep in mind, these chairs are solid metal, and Friend hit his head right above the neck where the spinal cord was located. Friend is really hurt and down on the floor. Nobody noticed this until Friend cried out in pain. Everyone looked over and saw him and Entitled Kid with a guilty look on his face. For a second, nobody moved, then it was pandemonium. I and another friend of mine rushed over to Friend and started helping him. Some other kids ran out of the room to get the principal. Teacher just stood there with a shocked look on his face. Friend's mom ended up being called and Friend was taken to the hospital where he was treated. I don't know exactly what happened at the hospital because Friend didn't want to talk about it afterwards and I didn't press him. Back at school, things weren't looking good for Entitled Kid. Even though the principal usually didn't punish Entitled Kid when he did something wrong, with so many eyewitnesses and with Friend possibly being seriously hurt, the principal had no choice but to suspend Entitled Kid for two weeks. Entitled Kid's parents were called and I and a few others were asked to stay to give a more detailed account of what had happened. At this point, you guys are probably wondering why this was posted in r slash Entitled Parents since there haven't been any yet. Well, don't worry, you're not going to be disappointed. 15 minutes after Entitled Kid's parents were called, an expensive car came screeching into the parking lot, way faster than the speed limit. The driver and passenger doors were thrust open and out came Entitled Kid's parents. They were dressed in business suits and Entitled Mom had sunglasses on. They stormed to the front entrance and threw open the doors, yelling at him. Entitled Father what have you done? Why is my kid suspended? At the principal. The principal explained why. Entitled father. That's BS. Entitled kid is perfect and would never do that. Your witnesses are lying. He pointed at me and the other witnesses. How dare you trust them over my son? Principal. Sir, please calm down. Even the teacher saw what happened. Entitled mom. Then fire the teacher. He is a liar. Principal. Entitled kid's parents, please calm down. We trusted you. Principal yelling now. Do not yell at me. Leave the premises now or I'll expel your son. Fine, but you'll be hearing from our lawyer. They left with Entitled Kid in tow and the principal collapsed in his seat and sighed in relief. He told us to go back to class and he'd call us down again later. He didn't say why, but he was probably exhausted after that encounter. This was the last I ever saw of either of them, but the story wasn't over yet. From this point forward, everything said here is from Friend's point of view and was told to me afterwards by Friend. This isn't the exact conversation, but it's the gist of it. Friend's total medical bills came to about $500 because although healthcare is free and they had insurance, Friend's mom also took Friend to a naturopath and an acupuncturist. Friend and his mom met with Entitled Kid's parents in a coffee shop three days after the incident to settle outside of court. As soon as Friend's mom sat down to the table, Entitled Kid's mom threw a $20 bill at Friend's mom and said, There you go, that should cover it. Friend's mom told Entitled Mom that the total actually came to $500, not $20. BS, said Entitled Father, healthcare is free. Friend's mom told Entitled Parents that they had gone to a naturopath and an acupuncturist and then showed them the bills. That's your problem. If you decided to go to some fancy pants specialist, that's your choice. You pay for it, replied Entitled Father. Friend's mom explained that Friend had been almost paralyzed, had damage done to his spinal cord, so Friend had needed to go to these specialists. Sure, he was almost paralyzed, snorted Entitled Father with a smirk. Nah, I don't buy it. I think you just wanted to take advantage of us paying and decided to go to some specialists because you think we can afford it. Guess what, lady? 
That won't work. I have x-rays and a doctor's note saying I should go to these specialists, said Friend's mom, showing him the note and x-rays. If you don't pay, I will take you to court. I'll press charges against your son and have him go to juvie. Friend told me that this was when Entitled Mom and Entitled Father started taking his mom seriously. Shut up, said Entitled Mom. The money, now, said Friend's mom. Fine, here's the money, you jerk. He pulled out his wallet and chucked $500 at Friend's mom. He then continued yelling at them, calling them stupid. Friend's mom took the money and walked away ignoring them. And that's the end. Entitled Kid ended up not coming back to school after this, so I didn't see him or his parents again. Ex-boss called me to yell at me for not showing up to work. Some backstory and general info. I am female with a somewhat unique name. Yes, this is important. I was 18, I'm 23 now, when I got my first job at a western wear store and didn't even work there for a full year. We sold mainly cowboy boots and did some clothes and accessories that went along with that general theme. I loved working there and it was a pretty great first job. There were two locations, one in my town and one in the next state. I stayed at one location in my town and my boss mostly stayed at the other location because she lived closer to it. She also had an employee who would go in between stores as the boss needed it. At first, I thought my boss was a really cool lady. However, that opinion would soon change. You see, she wasn't good at running a business and didn't want to keep paying the expensive rent for the building we were currently using, so she moved the store to an obscure location at the beginning of the summer. She admitted that summers were the slowest season, so in my opinion, it was not smart to move locations then. She would also avoid regular customers when they would come in to talk to her about their orders taking too long to arrive. I also heard she was a homewrecker and the guy whose marriage she ruined would come into the store regularly. Needless to say, she was a bad business lady who did whatever she wanted. After she moved the store, we started losing business. She started scheduling less of us, having maybe two employees working at once. Then she told me, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if you looked for another job. I remember that word for word. Looking back, I realized that was her way of saying, you should probably find another job. Soon we weren't getting scheduled at all. She was running the store by herself and she kept saying, maybe business will pick up next week and I'll need you. Then one day my mom came home and asked if my boss had moved again. I said I didn't know, then asked why. She informed me that she drove by my work and it looked empty. I told my friend and soon she drove by and told me that it was indeed completely deserted. I officially didn't have a job anymore. Thankfully, I was working at a barn a few days a week, so I had some kind of income. I did find out that this woman still had her other store open, so I was a little salty. Now the real story. I was chilling at home a few months after I found out my boss had deserted us when I see that she is calling me. I thought it was weird and answered. The call started off very friendly and cheerful, but then her jerk side came out. The call went something like this. Me. Hello? Ex-boss. Hi, OP? Me. Yes? Hi, this is your ex-boss. How are you? I'm alright. How are you? I'm good. Look, I'm calling because... Cue the jerkness. You cannot keep calling out of work like this. Me. Completely confused. Excuse me? What? You keep calling out when you should be here working. I have places I need to be. An ex-coworker cannot run the store alone. Me. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh? You don't know what I'm talking about? Said in a mocking tone. No ma'am, I haven't worked for you in months. She's silent for a few seconds, then hangs up. I sat there for a minute, processing what had just happened. I figured she must have a worker at the other store with the same name as me, and she just called the wrong one. But I have a very uncommon name, so that is unlikely in my opinion. And if it was a mistake, why not just own up to it and apologize? But instead, like a scared middle schooler, she hangs up. It was in this moment I lost what little respect I had left for her. I wish there was a better way of ending this, but there isn't. I never heard from her again. I have looked up her other store, and it turns out she eventually closed that one too, and now she works at an airport. That somewhat makes me happy. Part of me wants to open a store like hers and run it better than she did. We'll see. Landlord lost his business over a $300 security deposit. I rented a little house from a man who owned a painting business. The power was off when we came to see the property, but he assured us everything worked, even put it in the contract. The place was dirty and poorly maintained, so we negotiated the security deposit down to $300. Turned out, the heat slash air didn't work, along with the refrigerator and dishwasher. 
I asked him to have someone look at them. He cursed me up and down. He called and left threatening voicemails. He would show up unannounced and let himself in. On one of the visits, I showed him that the crawl space was flooded and was a breeding ground for thousands, if not millions of roaches and mosquitoes that would come up through the floor fins. There was absolutely no duck work, even though he claimed the heat and air worked fine. He accused me of causing the flood myself, even though I showed him the source was a pipe that had rusted through. He refused to address any problems and said, If you don't like it, then you can move. You can't pay for a bargain and expect to live in the Ritz. This man was a terrible man in general. Once, he hired someone off Craigslist to cut down a tree in the rental property's yard. The man worked literally all day for the agreed $150, cut up and hauled off the tree. He came back that evening just standing in the yard. I asked if I could help him. He said he was waiting for the owner to get paid. The owner kept replying, saying he was on the way, but never showed up. Our neighbor told us he had punched the previous renter in the face and refused to pay him for a day's work for his company. He had bragged about renting to illegal immigrants and not having to do anything because they wouldn't sue. We had a newborn baby, so we called his bluff and agreed to find a new place to live. We left the home in much better shape than we found it. He said he would mail us the security deposit, but never did. He dodged my phone calls until one day he called to say, You aren't getting it back. You broke the contract when you left early, so go forget yourself. I was really upset because we were new parents and had very little money. That $300 was a big deal to us and a drop in the bucket for this man. He owned an upscale painting business and had 15 rental properties. The next week, I was online leaving negative reviews for his business when I clicked a link and noticed his website's domain had just lapsed. I knew what I had to do. I immediately bought it, then created a homepage with contact info for his biggest competitor. I emailed him from his old domain, asking him if he wanted to buy the website for $320, the cost of the security deposit, plus the price I paid for the domain. He was irate. He started calling my work, threatening to sue my employer. He even contacted my parents and threatened to sue them. He left a bunch of threatening voicemails for me, saying he was going to beat me up and he knows where I live and he has my social security number. I received emails from several review sites asking if I was trying to update the contact info for the business. He must have used his old domain's email as his contact email. I didn't want to get in trouble for impersonating his business, so I did not respond. The contact info was never changed. I received a few emails from potential clients. I called him and told him about the painting job requests. I gave him the contact info for one of the clients to prove I wasn't just making it up. I told him it was the last time I was going to do that for him and suggested he buy the website back in order to not miss out on any other jobs. He told me he was taking me to court. I told him I had recorded his threatening phone calls and saved all his texts and voicemails. He said he was going to sue me for illegally recording him. Not illegal in my state. I said, I look forward to seeing you in court when I counter sue and press charges for harassing me. And I hung up. He called back and yelled at me for hanging up on him. I said, call me back when you can speak respectfully to me and hung up again. We repeated this about five times. Each time he was more angry until the last time. He spoke respectfully and explained he hadn't got a single job in months. I suggested he focus more on creating a website to find business. He lost it and yelled at me again. Six months passed and he still hadn't bought the website from me. I get a call from him, begging me to do the right thing and give him the website back. I told him the current price was $350. Six months later, I get another phone call. I told him the current price is $380. Eventually, he texted me to say, I went out of business. I hope you're happy. I responded, I hear having a website really helps your business. $380 and it's yours. He told me what a terrible person I am and said, Karma's a jerk. I responded, Maybe if you stop trying to rip people off, your karma wouldn't be so bad. This was the last time I ever heard from him. The major business listing sites confirmed his business did indeed close. I renewed the domain for another two years just in case he was bluffing. A few months later, I drive by his office to see if he was still there. It was empty with a for rent sign posted. I never got that $300 back and spent money on domain registrations, but it was totally worth it. Why I helped him and not you, Karen. This happened two weeks ago. I live in England in a decent sized town. Cast. We've got me, we've got Karen, we've got the store manager, and the location is Sainsbury Local, a small version of Sainsbury Supermarket in England. The story. So my dad had asked me to send off some important mail, 
and had asked me to go and do some shopping for some supplies for home. I say okay, grab the car keys, and head off to the post office, after which I leave my car parked in the post office parking whilst I walk over to the Sainsbury local, as it is only a two or three minute walk from the post office, reusable shopping bag in hand. I was wearing a blue hoodie with a pair of dark blue jeans, a face mask, and my everyday pair of gray shoes. Once I reached the Sainsbury's, I was told to wait a little bit by the security guard to allow for some people to leave from the small shop in order to maintain distancing. After a short wait, I was let in. I go to the fruit and vegetables where I begin to pick up the items I've been asked to pick up. Following this, I move over to the milk section where I accidentally knock over a stack of chocolate eclairs. I begin picking them up as it was my fault and I'm not a monster to let the staff of the store pick the items up when it's clearly my fault. They have better things to do than to pick up things knocked over by the public. I just want to take this moment to say thank you to all the frontline workers and all the effort they're putting in to help us all. I finish putting the items back where they belong and proceed to the frozen goods section which is where I hear an excuse me. I turn around to see an elderly gentleman and his wife who politely ask me where the cereal was. I told him where it was as I'm quite familiar with this store and have been most of my life. I said please follow me as I'm also going to the same aisle to pick up cereal for myself. They thanked me and I moved on to some of the other items on my list such as bread. So in the bakery section I was pondering which bread my dad wanted which is when I hear the dreaded throat clear. My original thought process was that I was in the way so I moved out of the way. I thought that was it and I was about to move on to another aisle when I hear another throat clear. This time I turn around to an old middle aged lady who was glaring daggers at me. This is the conversation that occurred. Me. Can I help you miss? Karen. I have been waiting for you for a while now. Who the heck do you think you are to ignore me? Do you know who I am? Me. I'm sorry about that. I was not ignoring you. I simply did not realize you were there. I, I was cut off. So you admit you were ignoring me? No ma'am. I was not. She cuts me off again. I don't care. Anyways, go grab me some oatmeal, you lazy good for nothing. Me, realizing that she thinks I work there. Oh no ma'am, I do not work here. See, my uniform is completely different from theirs. Sainsbury had a maroon colored jacket with a maroon top and bottom with orange lines on their seams with their name on a company logo badge on the top. Karen, BS, I saw you helping that elderly couple and then you were stalking the shelves just before that. You definitely work here, so get off your phone and go get my oatmeal. Me. I was just putting those items back as I had accidentally knocked them over and as for the couple, they asked me politely and did not know what went where. Admittedly, I was starting to get upset now due to the way this lady was shouting constantly. Karen, after using some colorful language finishing off with this gem. You useless jerk. You should be happy to get to work in these times. Get me your manager now. I'm going to get you fired. At this stage, because she was shouting so loudly and it was a rather smallish store, both the security guard and the manager walked over. Manager. What seems to be the issue, ma'am? Karen. I want this useless good for nothing fired. He was messing around on his phone whilst working and not helping me. She said this while smirking at me with a face as if saying, I've got you now. Manager. Takes a quick look at me. Firstly, miss, please calm down. Secondly, this individual clearly does not work for us. We have the uniform I mentioned before, but he is wearing a blue hoodie that's clearly not part of the attire. He is clearly a customer here. Can you kindly leave him alone and proceed with the rest of your shopping? At this stage, my anger was starting to dissipate, but you could clearly see in the manager's face that he was starting to get annoyed at this lady. Manager, can you refrain from such language in the store, please? If you continue this language, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Karen, why do I have to leave? He, pointing at me, is the one who didn't want to help me, and now you are defending him? More strong words were used towards me. Manager is now upset. Ma'am, please proceed to check out with all your items and leave. I can't have you talking to our customers like this. If you do not comply, I will have you removed by the security guard. Karen, forget you and this store. I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. Forget all of you. She throws the basket with all the items on the floor and proceeds to leave, escorted out by the security guard. Manager, are you okay? He knows me as I've frequented this store so much. Me, yeah, I'm good. Thanks for sticking up for me. That lady has a few screws loose. Manager chuckling. Yeah, she does. This is when we hear a very loud scream of, what the heck, from outside the store. 
Me, manager, and some employees go over to the source and see Karen's car being ticketed as she had parked in a handicapped parking zone. She was holding a yellow bag in her hand. This was a parking ticket. Apparently, during the time the lady was in the store, a police officer had come over to grab some items and had seen her parking and ticketed her, according to the elderly man who I had helped earlier. He said he had apparently seen the whole ordeal go down. The person who had ticketed her, the elderly gentleman's son who was waiting in his car outside. Elderly gentleman chuckling. Guess karma's a jerk, huh, young lad? Elderly lady. Don't use such language, Jim. Hope you're all right, though, young lad. We asked my son for a favor as he was nearby, and as you had helped us earlier, then you got treated so horribly by that woman. Good riddance, some people these days. Me, a bit surprised and puzzled. You did that? Thank you so much. The elderly couple then met with their son and they proceed to leave. The rest of the staff, me and some onlookers, then went on about our business. Manager. OP, what things were you here for? Let me help you. Me. Oh, you don't need to do that. I'm almost done anyways. The manager then gave me a good portion of the stuff I was buying for free, which I was very grateful for, after which I proceeded back home. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.